Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council meeting for June 6th. Appreciate everyone being here. If you join me, uh, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council President Beggs? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Council Member Sapone? Here. Let the record reflect that Council Member Bingle is absent. But he is on city business in Washington, D.C., helping us, helping our city out. Um, all right, well, we have three proclamations and a salutation this evening. And we'll start out with our uh, first proclamation, Council Members Zapone, for Pride Month. And he is going to be joined by Esteban Erevia. Um, All right. right. I get to kick us off for tonight. So very excited to read this one. Whereas on June 28, 1969, when police raided the Stonewall Inn, a safe haven for members of the LGBTQIA2S plus community in Manhattan, patrons and supporters of the Stonewall Inn staged an uprising to resist the police harassment and persecution, marking the beginning of a movement to outlaw discriminatory laws and practices and achieve equal justice and equal opportunity for LGBTQIA2 plus, S plus Americans. And whereas the city of Spokane acknowledges the value and dignity of each person and appreciates the cultural civic and economic contributions of the LGBTQIA2S plus community, which strengthens our social well-being. And whereas we are grateful for volunteer organization, organizations such as Spokane Pride, which promotes and empowers visible diversity for Spokane's LGBTQIA2S plus people, and through supportive education and annual collaborative events, provides progressive cultural opportunities and experiences for the inland Northwest community. Now, therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the Spok City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim June 2022 as Pride Month in Spokane and urge residents to recognize the contributions made by members of the LGBTQIA2S plus community and to actively promote the principles of equality, liberty, and justice. Celebrate so freely. My name is Esteban Adevia. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the president and CEO of Spokane Pride. Every June, communities around the world gather to celebrate and memorialize the movement for LGBTQIA 2S plus visibility and rights, or what we now know to be Pride. <clears throat> what started as a protest in New York City in the summer of 1968 has now evolved into people taking to the streets of their hometowns lifting up the very people in their own communities who need the visibility most. You will find it to be true here in Spokane. In June of 1992, Marion Hammer, Helen Bonzer, and a group of folks called PFLAG, or the Parents and Families of Lesbians and Gays, decided it was time to gather the Spokane community in pride and walk the streets of downtown Spokane. They understood our LGBTQ plus community needed the opportunity to be seen, valued, and heard in a very big way. Their work would carry us through today, where we now celebrate 30 years of pride in Spokane this June. Our theme this year is reimagine. COVID unveiled a number of in inequities that directly impacted the LGBTQ plus community. Our community experienced disparities in care and for some denial because of their identity. We experienced the greatest social movement of our time calling for the reformation of our systems of power and the amplification of a dual pandemic, racism. As an organization, we have experienced major changes in our structure and our ability to serve the community as we consider all of this momentum and shifting and the need for the reconstruction of belonging for all people, especially here in the city of Spokane. We understand our response to be to reimagine our future so that all have the ability to thrive and be valued 
and fully seen. To the, citizens of, to the citizens of Spokane, we hope that you know that we are proud of you. Even when your parents may tell you otherwise, we are proud of you. Even when your family may not say it, we are proud of you. Even when your teachers may not tell you, we are proud of you. Even when your religious community may convince you that you don't deserve to live fully for who you fully are, we are proud of you. Even when the doctor may not believe you, we are proud of you. Even when society doesn't understand you, we are proud of you. No matter who you are or where you come from, we are just so dang proud of you. This Saturday, while you may see a big party, we encourage you to look deeper and see pathways for people to have the opportunity to be fully valued and fully present. We encourage you to join us in the movement of reimagining who we can be and who we want to be together. So with that, I say, happy Pride Spokane. Thank you. Thank you, Esteban. And next, Council Member <laughs> Cathcart is going to read a proclamation for Home Ownership Month, and he is joined by Nicole Bishop. City of Spokane Proclamation. <clears throat> Whereas June is National Home Ownership Month and the City of Spokane is committed to supporting Spokane community members in their home ownership goals, from those buying their first homes to those striving to maintain and improve their homes. And whereas home ownership provides individuals and families a safe and safe, stable and secure place to prosper and thrive, all while serving as an important financial investment that contributes to community stability. And whereas SNAP financial access is committed to home ownership as demonstrated through immense community impact resulting in SNAP financial access saving 97 homes from foreclosure and helping first time home buyers purchase 109 homes last year. Now therefore I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim June 2022 as Home Ownership Month in Spokane in recognition of the hard work and dedication of SNAP financial access in growing and maintaining home ownership amongst the Spokane community. All right. I don't know, is, is Nicole she, here? Is she here? I don't see her, but Not seen we'll her. give a okay. round of applause. Right. <clears throat> All right, and the last proclamation this evening is Council Member Betsy Wilkerson is going to read one for World Refugee Day. And if Kimmy Curry, if you're here, you can join us at the podium. Kimmy in the room? Well, if not. Whereas there are over 26 million refugees worldwide today who are ordinary men, women, and children forced to flee their homes and countries because of wars, human rights abuses, and fear of persecution based on their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a social group, and Whereas the United Nations General Assembly unanimously adopted on December 24, 2000, a resolution naming June 20th every year as World Refugee Day to honor the contributions, courage, and resilience of refugees throughout the world. And whereas the citizens of Spokane, supported by residents, nonprofit organizations, schools, churches, and businesses, have welcomed thousands of refugees to our community since 1990, providing intensive support to help them learn to navigate their new lives as they add economic strength and cultural richness to our community. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim June 20th, 22, as World Refugee Day in Spokane as a tribute to the refugees living in our city and urge all citizens to engage in learning and appreciations of their experiences and culture. All right, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Council Member Stratton, but I'd like to invite Bob Peeler up to the podium for a special salutation for his many years of service, amazing service to the 
uh, homeless community and on behalf of the whole community. So. So tonight we are saluting the public service of Bob Peeler. Whereas Bob Peeler has served Spokane for 42 years through um, his work with Spokane Neighborhood Action Programs, addressing the needs of people in crisis in our community. And whereas when many in the community think of homeless outreach, they think of Peeler. And whereas Peeler grew up in Spokane and experienced homelessness himself while in high school at North Central. And whereas Peeler served in Vietnam, sending his paychecks home to support his six siblings. And whereas in 2018, Barbara, who was formerly homeless, said about Peeler, Bob really genuinely cares about people. He goes the extra mile. He held me accountable, helped me establish routine and structure. To this day, when I see Bob, he is proud of me and I feel better about me. And whereas Peeler's motto, when you are in crisis, you feel trapped in a dark tunnel, my job is to help people see far beyond that, exemplifies why he has been so important to Spokane. Now therefore, I, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the community members of Spokane, do hereby salute Bob Peeler for his service to the city of Spokane. I, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, do here, hereunto sign my hand, cause the seal of the city of Spokane to be affixed on this sixth day of June in 2022. And Bob, I invited you just only about five minutes ago that if you wanted to say a few words to us, um, uh, please feel free to do that. I always have words. <laughs> First, I want to do a clarification. I served in the era of Vietnam. I didn't serve Vietnam. It's a big difference. I don't want to disrespect our, our vets. Um, I came in 41 years ago. Life was so much simpler. We, we, my intake was half a page. There was no stupid data computer. My computer was all one box with orange print. So it's been a while, I'm old. Um, but I didn't do all these programs and all these housing by myself. Spokane is blessed because we have good partners. Through the guidance of Phil from HLC, VOA, uh, Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, and a big input and guidance was the city of Spokane. Mayor Sherry Bernard was very helpful, so was June Shapiro from the Human Service Department. Um, I feel very blessed to have SNAP behind my back, and they thought outside the box. I think I have the biggest personnel file for Buck in the system, but it does work, and community, this community does work with people. I also have the privilege of working with homeless people who are amazing, big survivors, and if you ever get a chance to talk and hear their stories, it's amazing the things they can do. I thank you for this honor, and thank you. And I, can t I, can, I belong to SNAP, so I could take the uh, Nicole's thing, too, if you want. Oh. Oh. Because I know Bishop. her. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Nicole yeah, Bishop. Yeah. You get two. I get you, get, two. you get a two for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to have an administrative report today from the city administrator uh, regarding some recent employee awards. Johnny Perkins, welcome. Thank you, Council President, Council President Pro Tem, members of the City Council. 
Deputy City Attorney, Mr. Piccolo. Nice to see you this evening, sir. Thank you, Council President, for this opportunity. We don't do enough here in the city to say thank you to our employees. And I've had the privilege and pleasure to work at a number of cities, a number of private businesses, but I've never come across a group of employees such as those that work here in Spokane with their commitment, their dedication, and their passion to ensuring that services are provided every day, day in and day out, that always does so with the safety, first, second, and always in mind, and with the expectation to every service exceed the customer's expectation. Last week, we had a celebration of our employees of the year for 2021. And I wanted to look at, acknowledge a couple of those. Go back one more, please, sir. Thank you. Oh, that's right there. Thank you. This is incredible. You look at these employees, and I know council members, many of you know all of them, and probably you all know all of them better than I do since I have only been here a little bit, a little bit over a year. But 40 years, David Bursley, Greg Edderton, 41, Joe Cavanaugh, Judith Knack, Joy Springer, David Rogers, 42, and Eldon Brown, who I know was here earlier when we were doing our briefings, 45 years. That is incredible that uh, that commitment, passion, and dedication to this great city is exhibited by our employees. As I mentioned, we don't say thank you enough for the job that they do. Surviving a pandemic, continuing to work, fixing our streets, our sidewalks, our potholes, picking up our trash, ensuring our police and firefighters were always there, ensuring our parks, our libraries were o are always open and available to the public. But I want to acknowledge another gentleman on the next slide. You're going to love this one. 53 years with the city of Spokane. And by the way, 53 years in the Parks and Recreation Department. Not just 53 years with this great city, but 53 years, Nicholas Semchuk in the Parks and Recreation Division. That is just, I, I, I can't even think of the words, and I'm generally not at a loss for words, but that is just incredible uh, to me in terms of uh, Mr. Semchuk's uh, value and worth and just incredible compassion, dedication for this city of Spokane. We looked at nomination for the teams in 2021. We had a number of candidates, our, commu our community health and human services homeless uh, team, our COVID response team, what a great job that group did, our four higher licensing team, our hill slide team, this is the Peaceful Valley hill, hill, hill slide, San Diego PD hiring team, NeoGov onboarding, and the water emergency response crew. And I want to let you know the winner on the next slide was the Peaceful Valley Hill Slide employees. What was significant about this event, and I wanna read a little bit about this because I don't wanna shortchange this. Sewer crews were actually out clearing a sidewalk at Clark and Elm, and they noticed rock, a rock retaining wall was pushing out large amounts of dirt on the wall. This is how this was discovered. Our crews were out doing their job, kept their eyes open. It's one of those things we always are talking about. Eyes, uh, eyes open, always looking around, knowing where you are, and they saw this problem. They immediately got it to their supervisors. They started to further investigate it. The next day, they determined, we need to close the roads to traffic. We need to make sure the sidewalks and the citizens of this area are aware. This is a serious safety hazard. So within a day, that area was closed off. The sewer department immediately built a temporary sewer line because that was the problem. There was a sewer line, apparently, that had been dripping for years causing the erosion uh, of this hillside area. And over the next week, the hill was like receding, moving every day, inches, inches, inches. Finally, a retaining wall was established to hold off until we could get some other repairs going. But this is incredible work by this group of supervisors and, and this team, making sure that the safety of the city was first and foremost and making sure this hillside in Peaceful Valley was retained. The next page is all the individuals on there. I won't go through the, all their names, but you can see how many individuals were involved in this effort from, the, from, from uh, recognizing the danger, the safety issue, to starting to correct the issue, and starting to come up with strategic ways, engineering ways, that this could be repaired and retained, not only to restore the, uh, the hillside, but also make sure our citizens and our residents were safe. So very proud of the hillside employees out of the public works department. Our next category was Employee of the Year, and we had quite a few nominations. Lieutenant Casey Austin, Alicia Barrett, Krista Boone, Don, Don Coley, Tessa Delbridge, Justin Dom, uh, Dom, Dominiquez, Dominiquez, thank you, sir, Rick Geringer, Jackie Churchill, Rick Napolitano, Clint Olson, Mark Olson, Lieutenant Josh Sampson, 
Officer Ryan Snyder, Megan Stanolfson, Jeff Town, and Thomas Yates. And the Employee of the Year for 2020 was Megan Stanolfson, who's with our Human Resources Department. And sadly for the city, Ms. Stanolfson uh, has announced that she is departing uh, uh, Spokane to take on a job in the private sector. But her efforts in labor relations, and all of you know how tough of a, how tough of a topic that is to begin with, but Megan has been leading uh, our seven open contracts with our representative employee organizations and just doing an incredible uh, job. At, at a time, she served as the interim human resources director uh, when there was a change in HR directors, but really leading and guiding, but really personally helped me a lot as we've been going through labor negotiations and is worthy and deserving of employee of the year for 2021. However, I want to close with this. Because uh, this individual, um, I want to say a few things about him. If I could take a moment, Council President, personal Please privilege. Stand. I've been here for 14 months. And this person has just been um, an extraordinary partner for me, uh, a godsend. He has uh, served this city, this community, with the utmost of integrity and character. Uh, he has passion. He has drive. He ensures that every day we get the advice from a legal standpoint, and every now and then he throws in some policy uh, conversations for us just to keep us uh, on our toes. But he's always making sure that the decisions that you are contemplating, the decisions that I take as city administrator operationally to make sure your policies get implemented are done so within the framework of the law, within the integrity of the law, and within the forethought of those legal scholars before him. I could not be as successful as I have been so far without his guidance, his counsel, his support, his trust, his faith, and his confidence in me. A couple times I've got out ahead of myself, and he'll come into my office and say, Johnny, um, we probably need to tack differently or take, take another approach. We always want to make sure that we're implementing the council's policy within the guidelines of the legal framework. He's decided to take the next step in his career and his life. So the chapter here in the city of Spokane is going to close, but the next chapter in his story just is beginning in terms of his family, his wife, his children, his grandchildren. Uh, I know he's as excited as we are for that adventure, that part of the, his chapter in life to begin but I just wanted to take this opportunity on behalf of the mayor and I and all of you council members and all of you and the residents of this great city, we need to have a round of applause for a gentleman who exhibits what Spokane truly is, class, integrity, character, and one heck of a guy in terms of his legal prowess and his legal knowledge. It's my honor to introduce, as he retires at the end of the week, the best city attorney not only in the state of Washington, but in the country for a municipal government, Michael Ormsby. Hey, hey. I'm not away that easy. All I can say, and I'm not often at a loss for words either, is having the opportunity to serve the city I was born and raised <laughs> in, and I grew up two miles north of here and lived in that neighborhood for the first 40 years of my life. It's been the capstone of my career to have the opportunity to work with all of you and to serve the citizens that we all work with in the city. And I appreciate what I've learned from all of you and from the employees that I've worked with at the city. And I can leave here saying that the people in this community are very, very well served by the professionals who work at the city and show up every day and make sure the water runs, sewers taken care of, parks work, streets are done. Yeah, it's, it's just been my pleasure and I'm gonna miss it. I, I gotta admit I'm not gonna miss everything, but <laughs> I'm gonna miss all of you and I'm gonna miss the fun things that, we've, that I've been a, a privileged to be a part of. So, and thank you for all of your service. So I'll be watching Channel 5, so <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. All right, it's kind of that time of year for recognizing people. It's great. Glad you're all here to see and hear those fine words, fine service. I think we're going to turn now to the consent agenda, and we deferred one item 11, and we added an item 18, and.
Ms. Pfister, if you'd like to read the consent agenda, and then we'll have some speakers. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one, purchase from DNL Supply Company Incorporated, Moses Lake, Washington, of sewer and stormwater access frames and covers to support regular construction and maintenance projects. $140,057.50, including tax. Number two, value blanket amendment with LJ Oil Company Incorporated, Spokane Valley, Washington, for the purchase of ultra low, low sulfur number two dyed diesel and supporting equipment from October 1, 2019 through September 30, 2022. Additional amount not to exceed $100,000 plus tax due to escalating price of diesel. Number three, contract renewal one of three with Applied Industrial Technologies, Spokane for as needed purchase and installation of grizzly conveyor feed belts at the Waste Energy Facility from June 1, 2022 through May 31, 2023, cost not to exceed $120,000 plus tax. Number four, contract amendment number one to the Downtown Parking and Business Improvement Area Management Contract with Downtown Spokane Partnership, Spokane. Additional $100,000 to be used solely for clean team and, and ambassador services and shifting the payment source for this amount from the city's general fund to assessment revenues. Number five, lease agreement amendments with A West Central Community Development Association to extend the lease agreement through December 31, 2032. Annual revenue $1. B Northwest Community Center Organization to extend the lease agreement through December 31, 2037. Annual revenue $1. Number six, contract with MJ Takasaki Incorporated Spokane for demolition, including asbestos abatement of a substandard fire damaged, abandoned, unfit nuisance commercial building at 801 North Regal Street as directed by the city's building official from June 15, 2022 through September 30, 2022, $469,900, including tax if applicable, relates to special budget ordinance C36215. Number seven, consultant agreement with Safe Built Washington LLC, Loveland, Colorado, for professional on call plan review services from May 1, 2022 through April 30, 2024, $180,000 plus tax if applicable. Number eight, contract amendment with Abadan Rep Reprographic Spokane for high speed large format printing and binding for the Engineering Services Department from June 7, 2022 through May 31, 2023. $150,000 additional plus tax due to a higher volume of printing needs and projects this year compared to prior years. Number nine, contract with J.R. Swigert Company Incorporated, Pasco, Washington for partial roof replacement at the Combined Communications Building from June 1, 2022 through June 30, 2023, not to exceed $1,207,028.94, including tax. Item number 10, contract renewal one of two with F.A. Bartlett Tree Expert Company, Spokane Valley, Washington for on-call operators services for multiple city departments as needed for May 1, 2022 through April 30, 2023, not to exceed $250,000. Item number 11 is deferred to June 2022 agenda. Number 12, contract renewal with NDM Technologies, Spokane Valley, Washington for the purchase of logarithm annual maintenance and support from June 1, 2022 through May 31, 2023, $19,591. Number 13, contract amendment with GIS Water Solutions Incorporated, Portland, Oregon, for the analysis of an additional site across the river in addition of one monitoring well for groundwater development evaluation from April 1, 2022 through June 30, 2023, $110,550 plus tax. Number 14, loan agreement with the State of Washington Department of Ecology for 2021 to 2023 biennial stormwater capacity grant, $70,000 revenue. Number 15, finance and community housing and human services funding plan to extend current contracts until the end of the year with the following organizations to sustain operations and needed support to our community. A, YWCA, $100,000. B, Family Promise, $250,263. C, The Guardians, $1,024,301. D, Truth Ministries, $312,609. E, Women's Hearth, $69,640. And F, Volunteers of America, $705,271. Total expenditure, $2,462,084. Number 16, report of the mayor of Penn and A, claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through May 20, 2022. Total $16,168,979.98 with parks and library claims approved with the respective boards. Wards excluding parks and library, total $14,583,925.76. Claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of Parks and Library through May 27, 2022, total $7,377,931.33 with Parks and Library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding Parks and Library, total $6,103,523.73. C, payroll claims of previously approved obligations through May 28, 2022, $7,864,908.30. 
Item number 17, City Council meeting minutes for May 16, May 23rd, and May 26, 2022. Number 18, consult an agreement with Makers Architecture and Urban Design Spokane for the development of the sub-area plan and see plan to action for the South Logan Transit-Oriented Development Project from June 1, 2022 through June through July 1, 2023, $243,125, excluding tax if applicable. Thank you, Ms. Pfister. And we have three people signed up from the community to testify. And the first is Emily Cameron, if you want to come down to the podium. And after Emily is, I believe it's Lakita or Lakita Davis, and then Val Coffey. So if you two could get ready. All right. Welcome, Emily. You have up to evening. three minutes. Let's see here. Good evening, Council President Beggs, Council Members. First, let me introduce myself, Emily Cameron. I am the new President and CEO of the Downtown Spokane Partnership. I've long been an admirer of Spokane, and I am honored to be a steward of the mission of the Downtown Spokane Partnership. As we work to support uh, the work already underway to grow a dynamic, safe, vital, livable, and sustainable downtown neighborhood for everyone in our community. While I haven't had the opportunity to meet many of you yet, I look forward to doing so very soon. But tonight I am here to thank you for your support and leadership to ensure Spokane's urban core has the resources needed to continue to create a safe, clean, and welcoming downtown. In particular, I'd like to thank Council President Beggs, Council Member Kinnear, Council Member Wilkerson, and Mike Piccolo in the City Attorney's Office for your ongoing collaboration. As a contract manager of the Downtown Business Improvement District, we are grateful for the opportunity to continue to leverage our established infrastructure, our experience, and our passion for the betterment of downtown. The clean team and ambassador services are essential. They are on the job seven days a week, welcoming back employees and customers, serving as a friendly face, collecting garbage, removing graffiti, maintaining green spaces and public sidewalks, and so much more. Their work is critical to our shared goal of positioning a downtown Spokane as a destination where employment, commerce, culture, and entertainment opportunities can thrive. So again, I wanna say thank you for your support and your ongoing partnership. Spokane has so many opportunities in front of it, and I am excited to get to work, and most importantly, meet you. So thank yep. you, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Welcome, Emily. We look forward to talking with you. Thank you. Um, and is Lakita? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. You can come tell me how to pronounce your name. Um, Lakitia, yes, Lakitia. thank you everybody, city council and everybody out there. Just on behalf of Volunteers of America, I just want to thank you guys just for all your support. Um, I'm the supervisor at the newly young adult shelter and we're just excited that you guys are supporting us and because that what you guys have done, what you've done, we've been able to shelter on the average of 25 young people a night. We've been able to connect them to resources for housing, employment, medical, uh, mental health resources, just Everything that it is that they say that they were lacking, that we were able to be there to be that, that resource. So thank you guys. And I don't know what else to All say, right. so thank you. <laughs> great. Well, thank you for your work. It's great to, it's great to have you on board. Down. Yep. All right. And then Val Coffey. Good afternoon, and I'm really sorry. I'm going to bust up the center of positivity here a little bit. Um, I am the adjacent property owner of the VOA Hope House, and it's quite ironic that I'm actually here to speak tonight on development issues, because much like the Cal V situation, um, the city council has imposed a cesspool of Hope House onto our business and that adjacent property. Um, it has been exactly what we, the taxpaying business owners, told you it would be, and that is a problem. And so I just want to make a few bullet points, because at the beginning of this property being developed, Fawn Schott, the CEO of VOA, made multiple promises that she was going to be a, and I quote, good neighbor to us. And so I want you to know what a good neighbor looks like. I think it's extremely important. So first off, since they've moved in, my building has been vandalized, destroyed, the fence cut, both customer and my own car broken into, rummaged through, stolen from, and vandalized. We never once had a problem in almost 30 years of owning that building. 
The staff verbally abused and harassed my tenant on a daily basis and did the exact same thing just last night to me and my father. The staff block our parking spots and the large garage doors so we can't access the building during normal business hours. There are feces all over Adams Street as well as the alley. And just yesterday, I watched yet another staff member walk their dog for a good poop right on our property. There are needles, arm tie-off bands, cigarette butts, and trash all over Adams, and that was also never a problem before. And finally, this is not just a women's shelter as it was marketed to this community as there are homeless men everywhere. They asked for emergency funding roughly six months ago, or excuse me, six months from opening, and now clearly we are funding them again. And I firmly believe that they should be finding their own funding because they have not done what they committed to doing to their neighbors, which is be a good neighbor. I also know that this statement probably means nothing because as she told me, and my family looked us dead in the eye, she can do what she wants, she will build her shelter, and the city council is going to support her. So I think that it's important to be on the record that you know where we are giving our tax dollars to and how it is impacting small business owners who've been members of this community for a very long time. And on a final note, I want to say a special thank you to Eldon Brown as probably the only person who advocated to help us in this situation. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, Ms. Coffey. Uh, actually, we don't, we don't, no, we don't do clapping. You know, I, I should have announced the rules before, but um, we'll be having more testimony tonight, and we don't cheer, we don't boo, uh, we just try to keep a safe space so everyone can speak their mind uh, to us. Um, some other rules of we don't you know, defame people. If you are going to speak to us, please speak to me as the chair. And um, in a minute, uh, after we vote on this, I'm going to talk a little bit about open forum and what you can talk about at open forum and not, because we've got a lot of people uh, signed up to do that, which is always great to have people engaged. Um, that is the end of public comment for the consent agenda. And with that, would have of we've been doing the the board or you're just vote, verbal. Okay. All those in favor of adopting uh, the consent agenda as read, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. The consent agenda is approved, and I wanted to note for the record, since a lot of us have been working hard on homeless issues, that we just did approve $2.4 million for additional shelter beds or <coughs> continuing shelter beds at the YWCA for those uh, people fleeing domestic violence, Family Promise, uh, which serves families, uh, the Guardians, which serves uh, single individuals in a co-ed setting. Truth Ministries serves men. Many of them are working men but don't have enough uh, income to qualify for housing. Uh, the Woman's Hearth, which is a drop-in center. Volunteers of America, which uh, funds lots of different projects. So thank you for that. And then we're going to move to our legislative agenda. But I just wanted to mention, because we had a lot of people sign up for open forum, uh, which is great, and we always each... We have council rules, and each year we try to figure out the right balance of letting people talk and also um, getting done in an expedited manner and not covering the same ground twice. And so one of our rules is that if something is on the agenda, um, we don't uh, permit people testifying um, about it, whether or not um, you can testify at, at the matter. And so the reason I say that is several people signed up to talk about water issues which if you're just going to talk about water is fine. But we, are, we do have on the agenda uh, con special consideration of the um, water conservation ordinance and the mayoral veto later. So if you were planning to talk about the ordinance or the veto, uh, you won't be permitted to do that at the open forum. Uh, so if you were going to wait till the end of the meeting, I just wanted to give you a fair notice of that. You can come back next week and talk about it because it won't be on the agenda. We, did, uh, we don't usually have public comment on a veto override because we just would have had full public comment on the ordinance itself uh, last time we met, which was two weeks ago. So that's, we did discuss it. Councilmember Cathcart brought a motion to bring public comment, but didn't have enough votes uh, to support that. So that's why there's no public comment on the mayoral veto of the ordinance special consideration. Um, so if you have questions about those kinds of things, I'm happy to talk with you another time about our council rules, but I just want to give people notice on that. So with that, let's go to 
The first special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36193, amending ordinance numbers C-36161, passed by the City Council December 13, oh. 2021. We deferred that one, didn't, didn't we? Yeah. We oh, deferred. I'm sorry. That yeah. is deferred. I'm sorry. To June 27, 2022. Yeah. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, ordinance C-36215, Development Services Center Fund, number one, increased revenue by $469,900. And excuse me, I'm going to go back and read the title. <laughs> Ordinance C-36215, amending ordinance number C-36161, passed by the City Council December 13, 2021, and entitled, an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency and appropriating funds in. Development Services Center Fund, number one, increased revenue by $469,900. A, $469,900 of the increased revenue represents abatement revenue. In the Development Services Center Fund, the property owner is financially liable for the costs incurred by the city, including, including securing and demolition of the structure. The city will follow through with the legal process to recover all abatement costs. Number two, increase appropriation by $469,900. A, of the increased appropriation, $469,900 is provided solely for contractual services to secure and demolish the unsafe structures and properly dispose of asbestos-contaminated debris. This action arises from the need to demolish a fire-damaged asbestos-contaminated nuisance property that is a public hazard and negatively impacts the surrounding neighborhood. All right, and we did discuss this a lot at briefing session, and I heard back from... Um, the financial people that we don't need to change any language on this. <laughs> so, um, there's no public comment for it. Is there any council commentary? All right. Seeing none, prepare to vote. All right. That passes six to zero. Next one. Okay. Ordinance C-36216, Traffic Calming Measures Fund, number one, increase the appropriation by $42,000. A, of the increased appropriation, $42,000 is provided solely for a transfer out to the General Fund Police Department. And General Fund, number one, increase the revenue in the Police Department by $42,000. A, of the increased revenue, $42,000 is from a transfer in from the Traffic Calming Measures Fund. Number two, increase the appropriation by $42,000. A, of the increased appropriation, $42,000 is provided solely for the costs associated with emphasis patrols targeting aggressive driving and drag racing along the North Division Corridor. This action arises from the need to deter increases in unsafe motorist behavior. All right, we have uh, one member of the public that would like to testify on this, and that would be Alex Collier. Alex, if you want to come down. Welcome, Alex. You have up to three minutes. Oh, great, thank you. I'm back. <laughs> All right, uh, I promise I'll push for some actual things, uh, w ways we can change things. I do have a couple more complaints. Unfortunately, this is one of them. Uh, I guess I can't wrap my head around another $42,000. As of this year's budget, the Spokane Police Department has a budget of $68 million. And I apologize, I wasn't at the earlier meetings, so I'm not sure what, if there's more information on this but I'm just asking for more transparency on this sort of thing. Um, yeah, as a police department does patrols and drives around, um, I think myself and others may be confused as in how is division just not a street that gets any patrolling? Is that just something that really, that we really have to put extra focus on? Uh, yeah, so just kind of transparency along that especially from a department that seems to have so little transparency. Um, this, this is a fact that spoke, or just police departments in general actually have the least transparency out of any department nationwide, being the FBI, the CEA, the DEA, any government agency you can imagine. Uh, by that, I mean any public information requests made the police department actually may, uh, gives back the least amount of those requests out of any department. So the more transparent we can be about things like this, I think the better informed we will be and the happier we will be to support these sort of things. 
Thank you, Alex. All right, any council commentary? Council Member I Kinnear. I should probably comment on that because Alex brought up a good point. So I was approached by Captain Meidel on this and she indicated that North Division, not just the street, but the parking lots are a congregating point for people who want to drag race, but also um, there have been shootings there as well. And so this pays for the overtime for Friday nights and Saturday nights when most of the activity occurs. So it goes on into the wee hours of the morning and the two extra police officers to patrol this, it's not just about the driving, but the criminal activity that goes on around this corridor. And it typically gets worse in the summer months, so we wanted to target this and try and abate some of this behavior. People are who live quite a ways away from division hear people drag racing. So it's disturbing to the neighborhoods close by and far away. So we're gonna try this. We believe that this can make a dent in some of this behavior. Hopefully it won't move it to, I don't know, Grand Avenue or someplace in District 2, I don't know. Um, so we'll see how this goes. I'm confident, she's very good at what she does. I'm confident that this will abate some of that behavior and we'll be able to assess that at the end of the summer and see how it goes. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the fact is that this is really just paying for overtime for the extra officers that we need to do the work on um, the aggressive driving and the drag racing. But if we were fully staffed by that, you know, we had a much more fully staffed police department closer to the national average, which is 2.4 officers per thousand. Right now, we're closer to 1.6 in Spokane. We wouldn't need the overtime. We would have enough officers on the streets to do this. So because we, we are in a position right now where we don't have those officers, this is a necessity. Any other commentary? Councilmember Stratton. And I would also say if this works on division, which I'm sure it will because they did it about six months ago and it worked well, um, but they, we didn't have to pay the overtime. But if this works on division, we're gonna be able to use this in other neighborhoods. So like in District 3, we've got problems on Monroe, we've got problems on Northwest Boulevard. And it's amazing how just a, um, a few hours of police vehicles through a neighborhood can change some of the behavior. So hopefully um, that'll be the next, the next phase. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, commend Councilmember Kinnear and um, Stratton for working on this and also kind of parallel, we had Councilmember Kinnear and I have been working for a while to see if we could use traffic calming funds for um, just patrols around schools and parks because there's a lot of speeding. That's, we get a lot of complaints around that. And for a long time, the police department wasn't willing to do that, but we did have a meeting um, the last month uh, and they have now agreed to do it partly because they were, got down the road on this one. So I think that we'll see more of that ability and hopefully address uh, the issues, which seems to be, uh, after many years in this job and going to neighborhood councils, a few people being really bad drivers. So, um, and police can, can help that. That's what they're there for. So, um, with that, prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. And that brings us to one more special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36217, American Rescue Plan Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $750,000 funded from the city's direct allocation of the state and local fiscal recovery fund of the American Rescue Plan Act. A of the increased appropriation, $750,000 is provided solely for the renovation of the Centennial Trail Don Cardong pedestrian bridge. This action arises from the need to provide additional appropriation authority for the Centennial Trail renovations to the Don Cardon Bridge due to increased construction costs. All right, there's no public comment. Any council member, council member Cathcart? Yeah, you know, this is one of those that was really frustrating just because of how, um, how much of an increase we saw in material costs and it really upped the price tag on the bridge. Um, but one of the things when we funded the last portion of this that I was pretty clear on is that I didn't wanna see any neighborhood uh, parks or investments get delayed or canceled because we needed to get this bridge done. And so this second tranche of ARPA funding for the bridge is gonna make sure that those uh, parks do get done as we had anticipated, which includes a few different parks, including Liberty, 
Wild Horse and a couple others. And so I just think it's important that we don't see a delay in those and, and that we're not putting off neighborhood investments for, uh, for a bridge like this. So I'm happy to support. All right, and the, uh, I also wanted to add that Gonzaga University is supporting this project financially as well as the University Public Development Authority. So thanks to that, prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. That brings us to resolutions and final reading ordinances. Resolution 2022-49, appointing initial members to the City Council's Equity Subcommittee. All right, we don't have any public comment on that. Any council commentary? Councilmember Cathcart and then yeah. Councilmember Wilkerson. Yeah, I'll just add, I, um, I, I'm gonna vote no on this. And, and the reason is because I, I just think there's a disproportion when it comes to the percentages from each council district, and that's a concern of mine. Um, I'd like to see a, a more equal numbers from each council district to make this up. But the second part of it is, I wanna see some more rules around <sighs> basically these meetings being open to the public. And uh, there's been some similar work groups that have not been so open to the public. And a lot of conversation that, that will be very impactful to the public is taking place. And so I just wanna make sure that all of these are to some extent complying with OPMA and we don't quite have that in place yet. So I'm gonna vote no for now, but um, hopefully we'll be able to put some rules in place to, to guard those meetings. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. So. This was at the behest of myself and other community members. When we looked at how we do our budget and the input of all the citizens in Spokane over the last two years, it was glaringly obvious there were some voices that were not being heard. So this equity subcommittee is advisory. There are different voices that will be available to the administration and to the council just to hear other voices. So as far as the OMA PA, um, this is something new. So we are working our way through it. The representation, um, people can still apply for it. We would like to have it uh, equally dispersed throughout our city, but we can't not control where people live and where people have an interest to serve. So at this point, we have 16 people who have stepped up, who want to be a part of this process that represent a wide swath of people and ages and professional backgrounds and diverse backgrounds. So when we talk about inclusiveness, which is in our charter, this is the beginning of that process. And we have to start somewhere. So I advanced it, I am supporting it. I'm asking my other council members to support it. And as with many things, we will probably have to do some tweaking as we go along, but Spokane, this is the now and the time for us to hear from many other people. And two years ago, we kept talking about, we were gonna look at our budget through an equity lens. And that was the buzzword. I heard it everywhere I went. And I said, do y'all even know what that means? And so out of that conversation, this is what got us here. And I think the whole city, all of us are trying to get to an equitable input and equitable outcome as to how the city spends its resources and where we invest our time. And if we don't know where that's at, how can we make an impact? And I just wanna add, I'm really excited about this equity subcommittee. Um, and it was open to anyone who lived in the city who wanted to be on it. We did a lot of recruiting and advertising for it, got a lot of great people. They're still open if other people wanna do it. And um, the idea of these subcommittees is, you know, we don't do, um, community testimony at our committee meetings necessarily. And so this is a way that we can engage advisory group. This group doesn't make policy for the city, just gives us advice on ideas that they have that we should probably be thinking about. And it also lets us test drive ideas and policies that we can share it with them and say, hey, what do you, what do you think about this policy? And particularly in equity where the city has been really rather behind in uh, pursuing equity uh, not out of any bad intent. It's just um, we're just learning about it and becoming more aware of it as a city government. And so uh, all kinds of people from very different backgrounds and experiences and ideas are going to be coming together to talk about issues of how do we be more inclusive and how do we get a better outcomes for all the people in the community, regardless of your zip code, and, uh, where you grew up. 
And so I'm really excited about it. But for anyone who is interested on it, you should contact Alex Gibalisco from our office, who's our equity initiatives manager. Um, you can get involved. And for the record, I believe we have always uh, complied with the uh, Open Public Meetings Act. We've been in close contact with City Legal on our subcommittees, and, and then they have work groups. And, um, but we're endeavoring to make sure that the groups work the way they need to and that people can know about them and be engaged if they want to be engaged in them. So with that, prepare to vote. All right, that passes five to one. And that brings us to another resolution. Resolution 2022-50, approving settle settlement for Chandra Hain from her claim for damages for injuries sustained on May 31, 2020. All right, there's no public comment requested on this. Is there any council commentary? All right, seeing none, prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. Next resolution. Resolution 2022-51, authorizing a loan and grant agreement with the State of Washington Department of Ecology for the Cochrane Basin Stormwater Treatment Facility Control Vault, $6,666,666.67 revenue. All right, again, there's no public comment requested. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. That passes six to zero. And that brings us to the next resolution. Resolution 2022-52, authorizing amendment number one of the funding agreements between the City of Spokane and State of Washington, Department of Ecology for TJ Minoc Water Quality Improvements, $1,386,538.33 revenue and Cochrane Basin Infiltration Ponds, $837,500 revenue. All right, nobody from the public has requested to comment. Any council commentary? Prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. Uh, next, an ordinance. Ordinance C-36156, streamlining the organization of the Spokane Police Department, repealing sections 3.01A.385 and 03.01A.390 of the Spokane Municipal Code and sending an effective date deferred from December 13, 2021 agenda. And there's no public comment, but just by brief explanation, uh, at the end of each year, we look at the ordinances that set up departments in the city and we try to make sure that they align with the practicality or on the ground of what's going on and we needed more discussion so we deferred it till tonight and we've since had meetings with the police chief and the administration and the council and we've come up with this that's going to eliminate two sub departments of the police department because they weren't filled with um, exempt positions and retain the other two sub departments because they were any council commentary all right, prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. Next ordinance. Ordinance C-36173, vacating the alley between Pacific Avenue and 2nd Avenue from the east line of Sherman Street to the west line of Sheridan Street. First reading held February 7, 2022. And Eldon, do you wanna give us an update on this? There's no requested public comment, but it's always good to hear from the 45-year veteran yeah. of the city. Thank you, Eldon, for your service. Thank you. This one, the applicants fulfilled the conditions of the vacation. They actually paid us $43,200 for the right-of-way, and they did closure work on the alleys and both ends of the, the alley that they vacated, so it's ready for final reading. Okay. Thank you. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, six to zero. Uh, next is the special events ordinance. 
And if you could read the title, and then Carla Courtright's going to give a brief presentation, and then we do have six people from the public who'd like to testify. Ordinance C36203 relating to special events, amending Chapter 10.39 of the Spokane Municipal Code, Spokane Municipal Code Sections 4.04.020, 10.39.010.020.040.040.050.055.070.090 and 17G.050.070 deferred from May 9, 2022 agenda. All right. Welcome back to City Council, Carly. Hello. Let's look at the microphone out here. Okay. Thanks for having me, everybody. So I just wanted to share this really quick. I uh, met with many of the large special event sponsors about two weeks ago, and I shared this information with them, so I thought it would be helpful for, for everyone to see um, all of this. So uh, some of the things that we heard a month ago uh, when we first had this uh, ordinance up on the agenda was the amount of revenue that the events bring to our general fund uh, based on their economic impact. <clears throat> So I just kind of wanted to put that in perspective, not at all to minimize what those events do bring. There's something to be said more than just economic impact, but also making this a great uh, community to be uh, and, and live and play in. But our, our general fund revenue for 2022, as you can see, is about 216 million and change. Uh, our local sales tax, we get two and a half percent, but the, the local sales tax is two and a half percent, excuse me, but the city doesn't recover all of that. Much of it is restricted or goes to the county. So really, we only receive less than one percent in unrestricted funds, which goes to our general fund. So, you know, a, a $10 million economic impact, therefore, from an event would generate about $85,000 for the general fund. Uh, this equates to about less than 1% impact, roughly estimate from all of the special events to the general fund. Now, I think, you know, to a point that was made earlier, this that does mean that they are bringing more in revenue than what is it costs to put on the event. So, I mean, I think, you know, there, that is a reasonable argument to be made, but I think we wanted to present this just to show that it's not quite this overwhelming amount of money that it brings into the general fund. Secondly, um, most of the uh, cost recovery that we're talking about today is public safety costs. So that is both police and fire. But I really focused here on police. That is the vast majority of what the cost is. So I wanted to focus more on that. Uh, per the, the ordinance that we're talking about today, again, it's primarily police overtime. For 2022, the uniform overtime budget was just about $2.8 million. Uh, in 2019, that was 2.3. In 2019, those special event costs, uh, the, the police portion of that was 332,000. That was 14% of their budget. So 14% of police overtime was spent on having special events. Uh, again, our cost recovery of that was less than half of that amount. Carly, can I ask a quick sure, question please on do. that? Is, is any portion of that uh, uh, free speech events or are these all actual? That uh, portion would include uh, the Pride Parade and MLK. Um, How about I, protests? In 2019, I'm not recalling any protests that would happen, but yes, normally if I were to go and look at a different year, there would be. Okay. So um, the Women's March is actually was included in this, now that I think about it, so that was in that total. That's considered a protest event as well. Councilmember Stratton. Okay, bear with me here. You're all good. Um, so police overtime is, goes up. We know that, right? Yes. So I had heard um, somewhere that there are police officers who are, um, you know, have four days off or five days off, and they get called to um, go do security somewhere, and they take those jobs. Have we ever, what's the difference between an overtime yeah, no. outlook and five or six young police officers who have the weekend off and they, they want to go work, but it's not necessarily overtime? It's a great question. I will do my best to answer it with my limited knowledge with respect that this probably should really be answered by uh, Spokane police. But okay. the, they do have what's called extra duty. And a lot of special events do contract extra duty officers. Okay. 
Um, sometimes those are those extra shifts that you're talking about. Um, some of the, well, the ones that I remember from my time when I worked at Spokane Police are working at the Apple store, basically, right. as a security guard or um, the temple. Um, so those type of things are what are considered extra duty. It is a much lower rate. Um, you know, the, that dollar amount has changed, obviously, over time, but my last recollection of it was about $42 an hour. What it's why we charge for special events specifically around the traffic and crowd control. So it's a little bit different job. Those special, those extra duty, they're not wearing their uniforms. For the overtime for special events, they are in uniform. Um, and so that's sort of what that, that difference is without being able to give you much more detail on that because that's where my expertise would end on that. But for crowd control and traffic control, we want someone in uniform who looks very official and people will listen to when they're providing that. Um, for example, we don't have secure, excuse me, um, uniform police officers work in say a beer garden um, just because of some element there. That would be something that usually would be an extra duty in a planes closed situation. So that's where that difference is. That could be negotiated, that could be changed, but that's currently how it exists, that those uh, special events are covered by overtime shifts with seniority being able to sign up for them. Okay. But to Thanks. follow up on that, just I might be getting to the heart of your question. If they're at the Apple store and they're being paid by Apple, is that that's not considered overtime? Correct. No, it's right. extra okay. duty. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Is that what you were asking? Yeah, because yeah. I had heard some people were talking about it, that you could hire... Yeah. Officers who weren't on shift, it wasn't overtime, you could hire them separately for events. And that, I don't know about the uniforms, but that they did have commission to be a little bit more than a security guard. Right. And it's, I just thought, would that help in this situation financially to some of the groups that need to hire? It would. It would have to be negotiated with okay. the police guild. I mean, I think at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. Because you're paying a lot for... Right. A police officer, and it's it's by right. seniority. So you have a police officer who's been with the department for 30 years, gets to work overtime, right. and it's a lot of money. Extra duty is much more affordable compared yeah. to overtime. Okay. Councilmember Kinnear. So uh, then I'm going to ask you this question. Um, don't get nervous. In addition to the overtime, it's almost the gift that keeps on giving because that bumps up their pension, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. So... It's not just the overtime, but then ultimately when you retire, that overtime goes towards a enhanced pension. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Continue on. Okay. Um, here's some numbers that I wanted to share. And of course, it's really small, so I apologize. <laughs> Trying to fit it all on one screen is a challenge. Um, but this was... Uh, some numbers that I just wanted to show over time, looking at a five-year time frame of what our costs were and what our recovery was. And these are for the big events. I didn't leave Hilliard Hijinks Parade on here simply because it's a parade, but I really don't consider it to be the same level of event. So, um, and you can see there that its cost traditionally has been pretty low compared to the other uh, parades and, and large events. So. The very bottom number is the one that I would focus your attention on, and I break these out in, a, in another slide in a moment here, but traditionally for these top events, we have a less than a 30% cost recovery. So for the most part, we already are subsidizing these events to a, a pretty wide extent. So breaking this down again, a little bit more easy to digest, our, and I lumped it all together into a five-year total. So Hoop Fest cost us uh, three quarters of a million uh, to put on. Uh, in terms of that, that overtime between both police and fire, we recovered about 320,000 or 41%. Bloomsday was a little bit less than half a million. Again, we recovered 60% of that. Big out in the park is considerably less. We don't have the, the traffic control there. It's just some extra security, basically, the, the crowd control that we have for that. They also hire extra duty, to your point. <laughs> so they have both uniformed officers and the extra duty. So this just includes the uniformed police overtime. We recovered 60% there. So the, the cost over five years was 1.3 for those big three, as I like to call them. For the parades, again, as we've talked about, we've never traditionally charged a parade, so we have a 0% cost recovery on that. The, the Lilac Parade has cost us uh, about 371,000 over five years. St. Pat's is about 109, 
and then the junior lilac is just a little over 75,000. So again, the parade total five-year cost is a little over half a million dollars. Again, we've not recovered any of that. So when we kind of give that comparison for the five-year cost to that five-year recovery, we've got 34% uh, for the top six events. Question. Council Member Kinnear. Carly, do we still, let me go back here for a minute. We used to have dump trucks and um, solid waste on both parades yeah. and events. So the, and those people had to stay the entire day. Do we still do that? We do. Um, okay. We have, we're making some good changes. Uh, the uh, Bloomsday has found sponsorship to do that. So we did that like the very first year that we made that change. I want to say that was back in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that time, I can't remember, it's not Shamrock, but it's another one of the um, concrete companies have, have donated their, okay. their time to do that. Uh, we're doing something new with HoopFest this year. They are, have um, made a, a lease agreement with a, a company called Meridian that has these really cool barriers okay. um, that we'll be using instead of the trucks, a little okay. less... I don't know, intimidating or, you know, unattractive looking, and um, we'll provide that security. So that's going to be a good test for us. They're also really expensive. HoopFest is, is fronting that bill. That's something that I would like to look long-term as a city of helping purchase or supplement that. Uh, at Lilac Parade this year, we did have the, the city trucks there. Um, so it's, that's an added cost that is actually not factored in here. It is, would be considered public safety. Yeah. Didn't really want to muddy the waters too much on that one, but it, it is an additional cost that isn't factored in here. Okay. Carly, one, sure. one question I forgot to ask last time. Um, I think it was, what, two, two years ago or so when we were kind of talking about this before, there was some discussion around looking at alternative parade routes that might be cheaper to protect or you know, deal with? Did, did we ever get into the weeds on that and look to see if we could find some cost savings that I way? I will admit that it kind of COVID sort of interrupted us on that one. We do have fairly standard parade routes downtown. Um, uh, St. Pat's and Junior Lilac use the same footprint, for example. Um, the the Lilac uh, Holiday Parade used a little bit of a different format, so I think we're always open to kind of trying to come up with that standardization to also then have it be really clear, this is what this is gonna cost. This is the route that you're using and how many hours, you have a rough idea of what that is. Uh, but for the most part, we haven't really come up with a standard route. Uh, I think the Council last- Councilmember Wilkerson, oh. I think, oh, had a question. Sorry. Go, I was just gonna comment, go ahead, finish, I'll wait. Oh, you're good. So I was just gonna comment, one of the upsides for this is stabilizing the costs to the nonprofits, because in the past, those costs could fluctuate, and then they would never be able to really budget of what those costs were going to be. So they think they're uh, come out ahead and they get the bill from the city and they're running in the red. So this stabilization and knowing what it's gonna be upfront that they could budget for or get underwriters or sponsorships for really in the long run is beneficial. We would like to all be it free, um, me too, but our resources really does not allow that at this time, and I just want to remind people that there are additional resources now for these events to apply for to help with their cost of running their events, at least over the next three years with our cultural incentive grants. Which, thank you for bringing that up, and I think that's really important. I, I can't express enough thanks to the events for being willing to continue to have these conversations, give us feedback of what's feasible, what isn't. I think that uh, that feedback from them of this is just not possible for us. So I think coming up with that flat free approach was really sort of a win-win as close as we can get to it of, you know, again, being able to budget for that. And hopefully we'll help them be able to apply for those grants appropriately and work on that. So the last slide I wanted to share, uh, just because this has come up as well, is um, part of the reason why we're asking for the increase in application fees uh, is to pay for new software that's going to streamline the the process, uh, I'll be honest with uh, COVID again and remote work, we're having a lot of challenges of applications getting just lost. They come in by paper, they come in by email, they come into the wrong email. Uh, so this is really gonna be a great 
new way for us to be able to help events. Um, that should be going live at the end of this month, fingers crossed. So the, the other piece of this though, again, just kind of looking at our commitment as a city uh, of how important we find special events is we dedicate a lot of resources to that. So SPD has a full-time sergeant assigned to work special events. That's all he does. So, you know, with uh, uh, salary and benefits, that's $150,000 right there. That is a, a cost. Riverfront Park does have four staff members dedicated to working on events in the park. Now, granted, their use fees help recoup the cost on that one, so I didn't really include the dollar amount, but I did want to point out that there's a commitment there. <coughs> park Operations has a recreation supervisor that 20% of her time is spent on processing the special event applications. About 50% of special events do take place in our city parks outside of Riverfront Park. Uh, you know, and so there, again, that estimate is just under 20,000. Uh, Office of Neighborhood Services, we have two staff members that spend about 25% of their time that is gonna drop with this new uh, software. We won't have to do the data entry, so that'll fortunately get better. Um, so right now that's about 53,000. I estimate about 25, that's gonna come out. But again, that's a pretty substantial amount of time and resources that we put into this. So you're looking at almost a quarter of a million annually that we spend supporting special events so we can have fun events in our city. You know, and that doesn't include the overhead cost of, of my time, of accounting times, of other people's time, um, the chief's time for signing the, the event permits. So I think, you know, I just want to uh, state that, that I think we don't want any event to feel like they're not welcome here, that we don't appreciate what they do. We do. Um, I heard our new uh, DSP president speak today about, again, the importance of a vibrant downtown, and I think our events really do a good job of doing that and make this such a wonderful place. But... We, we are, again, uh, strapped for resources, and I think this is the best compromise. And that's all I had slide-wise. All right, then we'll, we've got some speakers from the public. So first is Alan Hart, if you wanna come on up, Alan. And then after Alan is Cindy Zapataki, and then Val Workman. Well, thank you very much. I am Alan Hart. I'm the uh, Lilac Festival president. And I, I gave uh, Carly a fist bump because she has been uh, very, uh, worked with us very closely over the last, I don't know, about two years. I've been, we think we've been talking about this. Obviously, we oppose it. Uh, the, we are an all volunteer uh, event. We put on a free event. And if you were out at the, at the parade just about two weeks ago, we had many, many thousands of people packed wall to wall across the whole whole festival, and we bring in all kinds of great things, including our car show, uh, the food trucks, the brew fest, as well as a great parade, a great parade that has, this year had about 160 different entries all the way through. Uh, $20,000, which is the, for us will be the uh, the way it is at about 2025, according to the ordinance, uh, is, is it gonna be a burden? And it's gonna be a burden because we have to raise our funds from the community to raise their funds from the businesses out there. And it, we do that by volunteers. I do a great deal of it as a volunteer to go out and find, that, find those funds. So in essence, what we'll be doing is asking the community for more money to help us do this and find new ways uh, to, to support that. We want to, as the festival, want to work with the city and find a good, good way to solve the problem. I have yet to have heard anything about things like LTAC being used or anything of those type of items. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know the solutions, but I, I would hope that we'd actually be looking at different ways to bring those dollars in and take care of the police on this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. And Cindy, and after Cindy, Val Workman, and then Bill Burke. Uh, Council President, I'm Cindy Zapataki. I'm a resident of Spokane. 20 years ago, my family and I moved from Wenatchee to Spokane. One of the many reasons we thought Spokane would be a family and business-friendly environment for us is the many special events that Spokane offers, many of them free and totally fun. Among those, the three-hour Spokane Lilac Armed Forces Torchlight Parade in May is one of those special legacy events that makes Spokane special. For 84 years, the Lilac Festival, which is put on by all volunteers plus one paid office manager, has received an incredible full support of the business community and the city government. 
and we on the hardworking Lilac Board are very thankful. We, like the Hoop Fest and Bloomsday teams, put in long hours celebrating what is good in Spokane with a diverse group of citizens, and we can all use the encouragement of, of our council. We are part of a festival regional organization that works together to draw tourism to our cities. And we work with others in Portland, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Marysville, Leavenworth, Wenatchee, and Canada. There can be no doubt that these events and others fill up our city and hotels with those seeking clean, wholesome entertainment. Thus, we bring millions of dollars of revenue into the cost of the city, not just the city, but the businesses that are in your city and make it special. For this council to now say that we owe, we owe the city fees for what we do is very hurtful to our efforts. Those taxes you are proposing will put pressures on our organization and the businesses and the donors who support us. At a time when all citizens are struggling to regain strength and optimism after the destructive worldwide pandemic we have all just suffered through. We ask that you think deeply about your role as leaders in this community, which should be to nurture and encourage both the businesses with the events that make our city special and which add to your economic bounty. I recommend that you vote no on this untimely damaging ordinance. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. Uh, next, Val Workman, then Bill Burke, and then Sam Snow. I'm Val Workman. I'm the president of the Six Bridges Arts Association. Some of you might be familiar with that. Uh, more commonly, we're associated with Pig Out in the Park. We're the nonprofit that uh, raises money and organizes the event. Uh, as you know, Pig Out is free to the community. Uh, we, uh, I think we were adding up the other day, we had $25 million of free concerts in the last uh, 40 years. Uh, that's, that's a lot of money to give away to the city and the people of the city. Um, we like this ordinance. We think it's a good start. Uh, I do agree with uh, the Lilac Festival. Parades, that's, we should be covering parades. That, you know, that's something we should do. That's something we should be doing. And we need to find a way to do that. Uh, pig out, uh, we, you know, we've tried to, you know, we, we pay our bills. Uh, everybody gets paid. We have no volunteers. All the bands get paid. We have over 300 local musicians uh, this year. All of the staff is paid. All of the restaurants and their employees are paid. So we don't use volunteers. Uh, you know, that's just the way we've always operated. Uh, we're very ethnically diverse. Uh, we've hired uh, uh, intentionally local uh, vendors of all cultures. If you come down, you can, it, this sounds like a United Nations convention. If you walk behind the booths, we have real Vietnamese booths, real Mongolian booths. Uh, uh, you know, it goes on and on. So. Uh, we're, we're supporting this. We think it's a good start. Uh, I think it sh there should be an allowance for revisions. You know, if it's working, great. If it isn't, let's review it. Let's not put this in the cement, you know, where we can't change it next year or the year after. But I think it's a good start for this year. Okay. Thanks, Val. Uh, Bill Burke. And after Bill, Sam Snow, and then looks like Nate Culver. Welcome, Bill. You hello, have up hello. to three minutes. Mask off. Council President, Council, my name is Bill Burke. I've lived in Spokane since 1963, son of an Air Force colonel, and I think we live in heaven. I've been everywhere. I went to 27 schools by the time I was out of high school. I choose Spokane because it's a special place. I don't say that to you to entertain you or to boisterize you or anything. We have a very unique experience here. I've consulted all over America with events and downtowns and stuff. And this is the place to be. This is the last holdout in North America. I truly believe that. Community events are very important. You know, a lot of people think that community events are all for fun, and gosh, we all get together and blow up balloons, and, and we all have this big time. It's not like that. When I started Pig Out in the Park, it cost me $50,000 to do it. Today, it cost me $10,000 less than a half a million. I'm not kidding you. We've gotten to $493 million of expense to provide a six-day free concert, food, festival, 
in the city center park that everyone is invited to. You don't have to shoot a basketball. You don't have to, you don't have to run. You don't have to do anything. You just have to show up and have a great time. We've had to cancel our event the last two years because of COVID. And COVID has created a completely different environment to put on events. I've been to 10 major events throughout the state of Washington since January. I can tell you what we're experiencing because of COVID. The fact that little children, babies, are not vaccined yet, keeping the smaller, younger families away from major events. Every event I've been to, and it's been trade shows, parades, fun runs, jogs, you name it, I've been to them this year so I can anticipate what our situation will be. Events are down one third to one quarter in attendance. Right off the top, a quarter to, two th to a third is already gone. Also during the same time, it's not that COVID gave us a license to steal, but COVID gave the world a chance to readjust its payrolls, readjust the situation they want to create the environment for workers to be in, and it has driven up the cost yeah. of pick out $100,000 more this year than two years ago to put on the exact same event. We are very lucky. Our event, I believe Riverfront Park is one of the best outdoor stages in America. You can't beat the pavilion anywhere you go. You can't. The open space of Riverfront Park, it's designed well, it's managed well. It's a tremendous asset. But what we're really asking for you to do is invest in community prosperity mm -hmm. and community goodwill and community fiber. Without these events, can you imagine Spokane without the Lilac Festival? Can you imagine it without Hoop Fest or Pig Out or any of these major events? And, and I'm going to speak bluntly, if I may. There is not a line of people lining up to do these jobs. The people that put on Hoop Fest and Bloomsday are tremendously dedicated to their effort. Same with Pig Out. I do believe, like Val, parade should be free. That's a way for a community to show itself to itself. And it, it can't be put onto a side street. It's got to go down the main street of the community. But I, I really yeah, think um, parade should be free. Yeah. Okay? Thank you again. We're in favor of this, but again, the idea of parades and those sorts of events should have a different understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you for all that you do. Um, Sam Snow and after Sam, Nate Culver. Welcome, Sam. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you. My name is Sam Snow. I'm a, I'm a Spokane Lilac Festival director and next year's president. Um, I oppose a special ordinance. Um, for a lot of things that Alan and Cindy talked about. Uh, um, you know, the, the Lilac Festival and the Lilac Parade specifically are unique and are a special event for Spokane. And just bottom line, this fee will make it harder to do that. Uh, I want to keep Spokane a great place um, and it, it'll be more difficult to do. I think the uh, city's role is to keep the citizens safe during gatherings and events and things like that. And <clears throat> um, you know, things that require police support, and the police do a great job. Uh, and I would like to keep doing them, and the, the fee will just make it more difficult to do. So just wanted to say I oppose it. Keep it short and simple. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sam. And then Nate Culver. Um, evening council members, my name is Nate Calvert and I'm highly involved in the uh, Lilac Festival. Um, I do want to say uh, I graduated from Freeman High School in 2007. It is tradition in that school to march in the parade uh, seventh grade through twelfth grade. I've marched in this parade six times in my school career. In the fourth grade I was given the opportunity to ride on the Freeman community float that only goes to the Spokane Lilac Festival. Um, didn't make it, still a little bitter. Um, <laughs> as a sophomore, um, I was entered into a tennis tournament up north, and I purposely dropped out, made my uh, tennis coach very angry, because I wanted to march in that night's parade. And uh, my senior year, my sister, climbing a tree, fell out of it and cut her leg open like nothing else, and I got to learn how to drive a stick shift that day to drive myself to the school. A lot of fun. <clears throat> In 2016, I was uh, voluntold by my manager to go help out with the Spokane Lilac Festival for the first time. I was able to see the inner workings and how technical and how dedicated all of these people are 
In 2017, I accepted the chair as of, of um, visiting floats. I got to see other communities showcase theirs in the Lilac Festival, watch them build their floats they had worked on for so long and the pride that they had, the communication that they had with each other. You know, it was like a class reunion every single time. This past year, I was uh, approached to be given the vice president of our community float, the one that represents Spokane. We go to Prosser, we go to Seattle, we go to Portland, and even to our neighbors in the north. We showcase Spokane. If this ordinance passes, I am afraid that we will no longer be able to support this parade. We will no longer be able to support our float being built and driven around showcasing our wonderful city, a city that I grew up in. And I'm afraid that we are going to lose an 84 year tradition. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, council commentary. Council member, can you? Is, is Carly still here? Oh, can, I have a question for you, sorry. And then I have a question for, for council member Wilkerson. So Carly, um, if we don't pass this ordinance, the fees will be what? So the ordinance that currently stands says that we will do 100% cost recovery unless waived by the mayor or by city council resolution. So okay. if it doesn't pass tonight, I would believe that the administration would go back to what we've previously been doing, uh, which has been a 60-40 cost split with the big three and 0% for the parades. But I can't promise, I mean, I can't speak for the administration if that won't change at some point <laughs> in the future. Um, you know, this, this administration has made the commitment, that's why we're phasing it in, in recognition of giving events a time to, to make up for that, that COVID impact. But it doesn't mean that a different administration in the future wouldn't go to charging 100%. And when you say phase in, how many years are you going to be phasing it in? Currently, this is phased in over the next three years. So the way that it's currently written in the ordinance is we're not charging anybody anything in 2022 for the, the costs that we're proposing to go into effect in 2025. We're going to charge 25% of that next year and 50% of it in 2024. Okay. And then Council Member Wilkerson, you mentioned there are other things they could apply for in the next three years. Do you want to talk about that just a bit? I do, and I know that someone had mentioned the, the LTAC funding, so the LTAC funding is there. It does have some more restrictions, but out of our ARPA dollars, we allocated $900,000. We had our first informational session last week. So $900,000 over the next three years that community events can apply for to help offset their costs. So that would be rental, um, riverfront park, police, fire. So it does give those organizations time over three years to kind of pivot and look at their model, where their fundings come from as we kind of work through this. So really, we have not had this type of resources to support our cultural events, but over the next three years, we do. And then, oh, We'll see where that goes from there, but there, there is funding for the next three years. So um, as most businesses, we can change our model in three years, most businesses. And Carly, I have one other question. So right now, the parades are not spending, they're not paying for anything. Correct. That. So is it fair to say that the other, the other big events are then subsidizing those parades? Correct. I would say to even some of our smaller events that we charge 100% are subsidizing everybody. Um, mm -hmm. So we have, I'll throw out the Spokane Marathon, for example. We charge them 100%. Um, negative Split does the, the, the Windermere Marathon, the Negative Split Marathon. They pay 100% cost recovery in those. Those are a lot smaller events, but that's another mm -hmm. charge that we have in here is moving to charging those events 75%. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets a discount in recognition but yeah the the bigger events certainly are subsidizing the parades okay because we're not hearing from the very small events tonight correct mm -hmm. which and i know my husband put on the spokane marathon for years and years so yeah okay i know about those all right thank you welcome other council members yeah. council member Stratton. so val workman <coughs> you are brilliant 
thank you, because this has been bothering me, and I think you, you said it. I, I just am really struggling with, and this could be a conflict of interest for me, so tell me if it is. <laughs> uh, former YWAC queen. But I, I do think that when you have larger events here, or a larger event here who is um, supportive of this and has been working diligently with Carly, and Carly, I appreciate all your work on this, but is also saying parades should not have to, you know, take this burden or handle this burden. That just says something to me. And I just, I, and I think of the Junior Lilac Parade, the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and the Lilac Parade. I think they should be exempted from this. And um, if we could find a way to do it, I would be happy. But I, I do think just out of tradition and um, the fact that it involves not just community, but schools and um, smaller towns around um, Spokane. I mean, I, to me, it's like one of the last traditional fun family events that includes everybody, right? So that's my struggle in supporting this is if, if there's a way we could say, if we've got larger organizations willing to keep up with this and, and work on this and pay the fees. And they're saying, but you know, parade shouldn't be covered. That says so much to me. It and just, I, we, just, we only heard from one that said that. Well, I know, but <laughs> he's my hero. Okay. Yes. Um, I think it's something to be, I, I think it's something to be discussed. So I wish we could find a way to do that. I have a question. Council member, can you? We deferred this. How many times have we deferred this? I, just, I can't remember. Twice. Uh, we've officially deferred it twice that it's made it to actual council agenda. We've, we've okay. talked about it multiple mm -hmm. times. Um, okay. We could amend it. <laughs> yeah. We could. I'm struggling with council member Stratton here, and that's why I'm asking how many times we've deferred it. Well, nobody's paying this year, regardless. Right. Regardless. I know. Yeah. Or next year. Well, but it's going to hit them in three years. They're going to pay that twenty thousand, and and that's that's huge for. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I've I have really struggled with this. Um, <clears throat> I, I definitely understand the need for cost recovery. Mm -hmm. um, we have definitely limited funds at the city. But on the same token, I agree with a lot of what Councilman Stratton has said. And I just, and I don't think that what's in our current code is necessarily the right, right solution, but I don't think what's proposed is either. Um, and we could just keep deferring this and talking about it forever at the same time. But, and I worry, you know, we have the, the dollars uh, uh, for events, but those run out in three years. And in three years is when the big hammer is gonna hit on this. And so I don't think that that's actually a solution either. I don't know what the solution is to be completely frank, which is why I'm gonna vote no tonight. Um, but I, I do think that there, there is a solution out there. We just need to be more thoughtful and, and think it through further. Um, I am grateful that, that we did amend this the last time to include that reduction for neighborhood events because I think that's really important. I'm glad that's there. Um, but I, and I, again, I, I want to find some path of cost recovery, and I, and I, I don't even think it necessarily should be a, a $0 for parades. I think maybe there could be a small, slight... Um, amount that would have some skin in the game, but, but I think it's a lot less than what we're going towards right now. And so, I mean, maybe it's something like freezing it with the 2023 rates or something like that, but, but I think it requires more thought, more input, more dialogue. And so I'm just, I don't think we're quite ready to amend it on the spot right here. I'd certainly support a deferral if somebody wanted to do that. Um, but, but I'm going to vote no, if we do vote on this tonight. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, Councilmember Catcart. I'm not going to support a deferral because I don't know what new information would come between now and the next deferral that would make this decision any easier going forward. Um, that's the challenge. If we don't vote for it, it stays exactly the way it is right now, which is, you know, maybe it'll be waived and maybe it won't be waived under this administration or the next one. So where does that get us? I could recuse myself as I marched in the parade, and I have fond memories of that. Um, and my daughter was also in the whole lilac thing. But I know tonight, as we vote for this, it stabilizes it on one hand, and on the other hand, 
we have three years with monies to support these entities and how we go forward, even if that means it comes back to us in three years. But I have to say we cannot stay in this spot of indecision. Uh, it's not good for the organizations and it's not good for us as a city. Um, we have to do something to move forward. So I support it knowing that there are resources available to help these organizations over the next three years. There may be some new information, but as of right now, there will be nothing new. I don't know how the conversations will change or what would be said that would swing the pendulum one way or the other um, at the end of the night or in two weeks or in 30 days if we would have all the information. So I'll be voting for it. Um, and then I'll be working really hard to get those LTAC dollars and coastal grants out there to the entities that are in the room and throughout the city. Councilmember Zappel. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify, was there a provision there that says that we can decrease it in the future by council resolution or by mayor? Kind of like the, the, how the, we have been? That's a great question. The provision is still in there. We didn't change that. That says it can be waived by administration or council resolution. Mm -hmm. So we left that alone. So we could, I know in speaking with the events, you know, what if we changed our, our footprint? I think to council member Cascart's question, mm -hmm. like what if we used a different parade route? We would come back and look back. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're not trying to, you know, tax out events. It's oh, just trying right. to balance what that recovery is. So if it ends up being, oh, your event has really changed and we're billing you more than we intended, we'll make that adjustment. We'll make that right. And, and I think too, again, obviously I think come 2025, we'll be having a, a new conversation, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but this at least gets us in one place. The only thing I see in this is I think it's going to be hard for the director and the association lilac festival is moving forward and trying to get people involved and trying to get businesses to help out when they they would kind of be in limbo right because it's so you're not paying now or next right. year but we may have to pay and i i think that's hard to um to try and um you know, recruit people to be part of an organization when you're really not sure what's going to happen. And that's my fear. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mm -hmm. think one thing, if I could go back and do a lot of things differently, it would be for every event to actually send them a bill that shows this is what your event cost mm -hmm. and this is how much of it we waived. So there's a better, I think, understanding, mm -hmm. appreciation, and I think also could be used to make those arguments for donors um, to go after businesses and say, hey, I need a sponsorship. Mm -hmm. This is how much this event costs me or would cost me. It's an in-kind donation basically from the city at this point, but if that were to change. So, I mean, I hear your point, but I also think this provides some leverage to be able to say this is what we need to sponsor. I'll, I'll use the example of the Baroque uh, fireworks show um, that that was underwritten by, I can't remember which bank, but they, they underwrit it for years. And a couple of years before COVID, and we're like, we, we can't afford to do this anymore. And it disappeared. And I think it was gone for a year, maybe two. Mm -hmm. And obviously that was a really important event. Somebody came along and said, we'll underwrite this this year. So, you know, and I do think there is large community support. And I do think that this hopefully, again, I think to council member Wilkerson's point, mm -hmm. could be used as we're giving you three years to work through building those new relationships and partners and say, hey, we need a $20,000 platinum sponsor to help make sure that our event can go on. It could be an opportunity. So how badly would you kill me if, <laughs> as we look at this, if we could exempt the parades, the four parades, with an understanding, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, so hold your knife, that there would be a, a separate working group with that group to see if there are other options that might be more um, appetizing to them and to the city, but they're not part of this bigger group and the, the bigger money we're talking about. I'm not going to wield any weapons. I, I guess I would say this is, um, you know, 
the main reason for this conversation really started back in 2019 yeah. when I came forward to a different council, but to this mm -hmm. council to bring forward a new MOU with HoopFest that was for a 30-70% split in recognition mm -hmm. of the impact that HoopFest has on this community. And at that point in time, council did not approve it because of equity issues. And so that's something that we keep circling around a lot is, you know, who should pay what, what is fair. At that time, the council's direction was come back with something that everybody pays something. And that's, that's where we have here on the table. So right. I'm, if we wanna, if we wanna look at something different, that's fine, but that's why we have this right. on the table was the direction from council at that point in time. Councilmember Wilkerson. And I'm done. So, you know, we have these legacy parades currently and they're, we want them at no cost. So where do we cap if uh, other entities start showing up and say, we want to do a parade? So we have three now, it's like, oh wow, it won't cost me anything. So all of a sudden, we may have a parade every week. But Not think of what we could do if we had a, a working group of the parades mm -hmm. and every year, rather than being you know, stuck with a $20,000 fee, mm -hmm. that maybe there's an agreement that they work together to a, to form a tranche, is that the new word, tranche? Bucket. A bucket <laughs> where they could, all of them, contribute some funding for those upcoming parades if they're going to, if we're gonna have more, you know, to help new and upcoming parades. But at least it's something to just set them apart. I, I think that's amazing. I have to, thank you, Carly. The one thing that you brought up that had not been brought up this came up because it was an equity issue and how do we make it fair right. across the board throughout our city for all of the events that make this a very rich and vibrant place to be. Right. And we have to set some type of standard. Um, and it just can't be at the whim of the mayor or the whim of the council or who's ever in that elected seat. Right. Then I would have to be challenging, well, how was that equitable and who had access to that? And that's always an ongoing question that many of us ask for a lot of things that happen in our city. Um, who has access to the people who are making those decisions? So we have to have some type of framework uh, as a, at least as a foundation of a place to start. Councilmember Zappan. Yeah, I think um, overall this is very hard. Mm -hmm. Definitely these are beloved events. Uh, I've even written college papers about events in Spokane to spread the joy of Spokane the world so know how important these are um, but no everything does have to be balanced and that equity is really important uh, how do we decide the parades do get 25 percent but maybe that's not the right number we don't know yet I think this phase and approach is the good way to start seeing if it's working and there are other mechanisms in this that we can revisit if it's not working um, there's always a provision that it's not working that the mayor and council can do by resolution um, we can always amend it if it's not working mm -hmm. so I don't think deferring it without new information where next year we might have a work group that can bring forward a new solution or something like that. And I think that's why I'm gonna support it now. I, I don't think this will kill anything because I think, uh, or any parade or any event, I think everybody in the city of Spokane's committed to supporting events. And so um, if it's not working, we can talk about it again. All right. Everyone's done, I'll finish up. Um, first of all, just my deepest thanks to Carly. We've been working on this for, I don't know, maybe it seems like five or six years. Uh, you've 2017. Been, yeah, um, so, and you've done great work and you've kept your cool despite being given uh, contradictory instructions by different councils and different administrations. So thank you uh, for that. And thanks for keeping our communication with our event sponsors and thanks to our event sponsors for uh, continuing to hang in there with us. It has only improved, has gone on. I think uh, one of the challenge for city council is as much as we like any particular event, is we have to look out for the whole city. And uh, every dollar that we waive in security costs and traffic costs at an event is a dollar that we don't have for the neighborhoods and all the people who are looking for better police responses um, and traffic control and all those things. And so it's uh, it's a bit of a zero-sum game when it comes to police resources and uh, paying for it. And that's why this started, is that we had lots of calls from our community to spend more police resources doing more traditional policing things. And the police department came to us and said, well, we're spending all this on special events, so if we could get some cost recovery, 
uh, we'd be able to respond to all the other requests for service. And so that's, that's how I look at it that we're trying to do it, but how can we leverage things and make it work and keep the events working? And so the very first thing is that we're not charging 100%. We're not. So we're splitting the cost uh, with the organizers for a lot of these events. Um, and then the second thing that we do um, is we do have the lodging tax money. We have about $120,000 every year to support these events. Um, for marketing. No, it's for security. It's not just marketing. It's, they can pay for police. When did that change? A few years ago. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so it can. It can but... What this does, by saying that there's an actual bill, it means that when the groups come to the LTAC, they're probably going to ask for money to pay for their police and fire, as opposed to some uh, other thing. But we should have enough um, uh, in the LTAC annually, uh, if the LTAC board really likes these events, which I think they, they're supportive, uh, to cover most of these things. Uh, also, when we actually put a bill on it, it makes us get more creative. I remember talking to Alan a couple years ago when we were talking about this, and he was making the pitch to me of how challenging it would be. And so I got on the phone, and I talked to the DSP, and I said, DSP, you know, all this economic benefit that helps your members, you guys need to chip in. And they said they would. And they announced this year, as a result of that phone call, that they're having a grant program for these events that you can go to. So that's an additional. And then, of course, we have the ARP funds, uh, which can go, that will take care of anything for the next uh, few years and also can be spent on things other than security so that you can subsidize other things and save that money for future years. So I really think over time with the phase-in, with the ARPA money, with other um, uh, contributors that are benefiting from these events, and then finally the LTAC ongoing, I think we're all going to be fine. And if for some reason we're not, as everyone has said, we'll come back and make it work. But this will make it predictable. It's a flat fee. It will have skin in the game so that people will manage their security and event costs better uh, and will encourage other people to join in. So I think as scary and um, as it is for the events that haven't paid in the past, uh, I think there's a way forward that will make it more vibrant and increase more. So. Can I say one yeah. thing? So, Carly, thank you for all your work. Mm -hmm. I want you to know I can't vote for this. I'm going to oppose it. But I'm available if there, if we okay. need to sit down and find some creative ways because I really right. believe that we owe it. We owe that extra conversation to some of those mm -hmm. parades. Our work is not done tonight. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. With that, prepare to vote. All right, it passes four to two. All right, next ordinance. Ordinance C36214, amending ordinance C26266 that vacated Gardner Avenue from the extended west line of lot 47, block two of Keystone Edition to the extended west line of lot 63, block two of Keystone Edition. The same being located between Howard and Washington streets in the city and county of Spokane and providing for an effective date. This releases an easement. All right. Eldon, you're going to give us a little preview. We don't have any community comment, but I always appreciate your presentations. Yeah, this is just a piece of Gardner Avenue, which is on the south side of the parking lot there between Howard and Weston on the arena site. And the stadium's going to go across that. And so we did have sewer and water also in that right away and that's been relocated at this point in time so but we will be coming back I probably should show you the map here but in the middle of it on here there's still Boy Scout way on the east side of this where the ticket booth is out there in the the area out there Gardner was on the west Boy Scout way was on the east we just vacated a piece out of the center years ago and I think just primarily because those are the entrances going in and out of the actual parking lot so we will be coming back at some point in time to vacate the rest of Boy Scout Way and Gardner, and we've already relocated the utilities out of the street in there, but we did have an easement in there for Lumen at this point in time that we're just trying to actually eliminate. Okay. So that's the purpose of this actual easement. All right, great, thank you. Any yep. council commentary? All right, seeing none, prepare to vote. All right, that passes six to zero. We have a couple of first reading ordinances, no requested public comment for that. 
Ordinance C-36218 relating to membership terms, Spoca term Spokane Park Board members adopting a new section 4.11.015 to chapter 4.11 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Ordinance C-36219 amending Ordinance C-33366 that vacated Napa Street from Pinecrest Avenue to the south line of 26 Court, Napa Street from the south line of Pinecrest Avenue to 150 feet south of Pinecrest Avenue. Releases an easement. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. All right, that brings us to our last legislative matter before we go to open forum, and that's a special consideration. S1, consideration of mayoral veto of ordinance C36209, establishing water conservation and drought response measures, enacting a new section 13.04.1925 and amending section 13.04.300 of the Spokane Municipal Code. All right, any council commentary? All right, I'll just say, just briefly, a, a couple of things. We've gotten lots of um, community feedback on all perspectives on the issue. I think there was some misunderstanding about what this ordinance does. There was some talk that somehow there were actual penalties or that it was a misdemeanor or surcharges were part of this and I, in my opinion that's not true. The misdemeanor thing I wanted to just clarify. So the, the chapter that this is part of already had language that says if you violate this chapter like you steal water from a water, a fire hydrant, that is a misdemeanor. What we, the only change we made was a provision that says if you um, uh, water more than four days a week or you water in the middle of the day, it is not a misdemeanor. So we made it clear that it was not a misdemeanor. But some people, when they read it, they didn't understand that. And then we deferred any type of uh, action uh, to um, try to discourage people um, from watering outside these new norms and standards uh, until uh, at two watering seasons from now at the end of 2023. There's nothing in here where it goes automatically to surcharges or rate changes or penalties or anything like that. We're going to look to the water department to come to us and say what's been working or not working. We previously approved uh, money for education and for incentives. So we're going to get a chance to see how that works. One thing we added to this particular ordinance um, right before we passed it is a duty to the water department to do education. And so we'll see that. And we're also going to, I believe, in 2023 is our normal time to adjust water rates and, and things like that. And we had made a change where we had a higher unit rate for the super water users uh, a couple of years ago. So we will be able to see all those things. So uh, it recognizes a new norm of what's normal watering in the summer and then what's normal watering if there's a drought and sets those standards, but there are no surcharges or penalties or investigations. Um, people can still call the water department if they think there's a problem. I got an email today. There was a sprinkler broken at the North 40 um, new store out in Airway Heights, and they just wanted to know how to get it resolved. So I got them to the water department. So there may be that, but there's nothing that requires people to complain or do anything like that. So just wanted to bring that up. And right. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Okay. Now we have mics, so we like to hear our voices sometimes. Um, but yeah, I know this has been blowing up all of our inboxes. A lot of people in the community are really concerned about that. And I think um, some of the statements made by the mayor and the veto were not ex exactly correct. So I think it's important Council President addressed some of those. But this ordinance is rooted in education and outreach. I think that's the most important thing. Um, it's simply setting a normal of what we expect from each other in Spokane around water usage. It's common sense. When there's a drought, we don't water in the hottest part of the day. We don't water every day. We water every other day. It's simply just don't be wasteful. Um, this ordinance will continue to use incentives. And um, we know, though, that incentives alone are really difficult to work here in Spokane. Um, we've been trying that for multiple years. And it hasn't seen a dramatic change in our water usage. And the reason is, is because water is really cheap in Spokane. We had a proposal about incentives, and we looked at that, and it would have saved the average person about $2 in the summer on their water usage. $2 is hardly an incentive. Um, the mayor said she supported incentive use. 
but yet she never came forward with a proposal on incentives. She had over a year and a half to come forward with a proposal that uh, would work better. So there's not a real alternative proposal for us to even consider around incentives. Uh, I also wanna set it clear that the mayor claims that she doesn't wanna be in a community where neighbors tell on neighbors. However, that same day she tweeted uh, about, uh, I'll just quote it, that this is exactly what our police officers need. Neighbors looking out for nefarious activity, more sets of eyes on the street helping SPD. So clearly the mayor's support of neighbors helping our set standards of what we expect from each other in our neighborhood. Um, I also think that there's a slight double standard here. The mayor believes in using incentives for some, but using accountability to make the most vulnerable in our community, especially homeless individuals, more uncomfortable. So sure, you can argue that homelessness and nefarious activity like drug trade are different than water use. However, we have to impact, consider the impact on our community and our costs. Um, we need to look at the overall costs and the impacts of excessive water use on our community. What is the environmental cost? What is the economic cost? What is the cultural and societal cost? Those add up to way more than $100,000. They're millions and millions of dollars and in fact are priceless. If we don't have a river in the future that supports an economically biodiverse uh, uh, protecting the red bank trout, we lose the ecosystem in our river. We lose the tourism attached to the river. We're building infrastructure to help water our lawns and that costs us a lot of money too. And the direct tie of the river to our community and our history is incredibly important. So these common sense changes create a norm about what we're gonna be doing and how we expect to use water in the future. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I would just strongly push back on just about everything that was just said. Uh, <laughs> first, if you take somebody who's already drastically reduced their water, you look at their bill and you say, oh, they'd save $2. Sure, that's easy. But the fact is there's a lot more people that we can affect with incentives than with mandates. Uh, in fact, there's thousands and thousands of users who mandates will have zero effect on because they're outside the city entirely. They won't, they won't reduce their water usage and the rest of the city is subsidizing that. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's create a policy that encourages them to reduce their water usage rather than using a, a heavy handed approach. Um, the idea that we can compare, you know, a, a drug house or a a crime house where they've got a bike chop shop going on and a lot of actual criminal activity to the sweet lady who just forgot to turn off her sprinklers is kind of absurd. I mean, you, there is absolutely no comparison whatsoever. And the idea that we need accountability is 100% accurate. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't think we need accountability for the sweet lady who forgot to turn off her sprinkler. That's just silly. And if we're going to talk about education, let's educate people. We don't need a whole bill that talks about how we will eventually surcharge people $20 per violation if, if they um, violate this. We, we don't, it's just, it's just silly to me. We, we have a much better way to go about this. Let's incentivize, let's educate, not use a heavy hand. It doesn't take a lot. Just a conversation with people. Most of the people that I've talked to and heard from have not heard one word from the city in the last year since we guess what, already passed this, according to the, the, the same plan, basically, that, that, we've already, that we're talking about. We already passed it a year ago as a voluntary measure. We keep hearing tonight and two weeks ago that this is voluntary. It's the same exact thing. But the public hadn't heard from the city. There wasn't a lot of outreach to educate um, that I'm aware of. There wasn't a lot of uh, incidents of, again, the sweet old lady who left her water sprinkler on and then code enforcement or... SPD or utility people coming out to educate her. That didn't happen. I mean, it, it may have in a rare instance, um, and maybe because they reached out to council members or something like that, and so it got passed along, but that just didn't happen. We didn't have people going out, driving around, looking for those errors to educate them. That's what should be happening if you really want to educate people on that reduction. We can do that. We can do it right now. We don't need a heavy-handed approach to educate people on what is good practice and what I agree. Makes common sense. Don't water during the day. But we don't need a law that says that. It's common sense. So we don't need a law. <laughs> Plain as day. So I would just push back strongly. I'm sorry, but to compare actual criminal activity 
to happening to leave your water on at the wrong time of day, there is no comparison whatsoever. The idea that somebody who's already significantly reduced their water usage and you're gonna look at their bill and talk about a 20% year over year reduction or 40% year over year reduction and suggest that that's an example of the entire city. By the way, also including commercial users, industrial users, residential users, the, the amendment that I propose would have affected all users, including those outside the city. So the reductions could have been significant if they were taken seriously. And unfortunately, they were not. And unfortunately, we are where we are, where we're gonna override this veto. But, and I will not be supporting the override. Councilmember Stratton. Okay, I know you're sick of me talking, but mm -hmm. I have to share something because I wanna bring this back to the core, why we're here. I'm gonna be, um, I'm going to read an email. We've gotten hundreds of emails um, over the last couple of weeks, but I wanna read an email I got from a 16 year old young woman um, today. And I wanna read it because I think it, it kind of brings it back. Um, she says she was born and raised right here in Spokane. And I wish I didn't have to take the time to write to you today. I wish I didn't have to step in to assist the older generation, but obviously not enough people care. To those of you against this ordinance, please stop thinking about inconveniences and think about our future. I cannot believe the reasons holding back the passing of this ordinance are based largely on people's reluctance to think beyond the appearance of their lawns. Please consider that there are problems bigger than having to reset your water timer. Summer is coming up and while some, someone my age, and then she says 16, should be looking forward to spending a carefree summer in the sun. Instead, I'm worried for the air quality and our forests and lands beginning to turn to ash. This is a part of my reality at 16. And it's crazy to me to think that none of you had to go through what the youth of today are experiencing when you were young. It made me so happy to hear that most of you passed this water conservation ordinance and made me feel a glimmer of hope to hear leadership in Spokane are starting to step up around climate change. Um, the ordinance was overturned, was vetoed, but you have the power to keep it on track. This is very important to me and others my age because this matters um, and it impacts the long-term health of our precious wildlife river ecosystems, as well as the health of the people in our community. Please, if you care about Spokane, Spokane's people, and my generation, pass this ordinance again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I don't see anything in this ordinance that's heavy handed. There is not a surcharge coming in two years. That is not there. There was in a prior version of it. That, that was <coughs> true, but we took that out intentionally for that because um, we don't know if a surcharge is the right way. There's all sorts of issues with a surcharge. You gotta pay people to enforce it. Mm -hmm. You do that. There are other ways, there are water rates that uh, may do it, which would affect um, outside the city. So they're just, I don't see anything heavy handed in it. Uh, there might have a previous version in it. Also, I totally agree with you, Council Member Cathcart, that there should have been way more education, mm -hmm. but that's the water department. And now the law says water department, you have to do it. There should be a utility bill inserts. There should be people out there doing those things. And um, with the mayor, if we take her at her word that she wants to do that education. She needs to instruct her staff and administration to do that. And if they need more money to do that, we're ready. Every year uh, in the last few years I've been in public works, I've been trying to give them more money for things like that, but I can't make them hire people. Uh, and that. So I agree with you. We need education. I would love to see uh, the administration propose an incentive program, the one that they think will be working, because if we can get there with education and incentives that the water department actually does, then that's great. Um, all this ordinance does is say this is where we want to get. We want to get to every other day watering uh, and no watering in a thing so that everybody knows. Just like when you're going through the neighborhood, we set the speed limit at 25 miles an hour. We don't have police out there checking, but the vast majority of people drive the speed limit in neighborhood residential once they know what it is. And we're counting on it. We're not trying to get to every last person with this ordinance that's over watering. So it's meant to set the norm so that people know, and it has already stimulated an amazing conversation across the community of what's needed, and it's there. So 
I look forward to the mayor's proposal on how to really increase education and incentives like she wants to. And then at the end of 2023, when we're doing water rates and looking at all that, we can see, okay, what worked and what doesn't. And if we can achieve our goal of 25% reduction, we're gonna save tens of millions of dollars on infrastructure, and we're gonna solve problems like we have on the West Plains right now where we don't have a shortage of water out there, but we have a shortage of infrastructure, and so people can't get building permits to build the housing that we need out there. And so there's so many reasons to support this uh, if people can find their, their one reason of why they care about water conservation. So, Council Member Kinnear. I don't mean to disagree, but I will. Yeah. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of outreach by our own team. So, Kara Odegaard spent a year and a half, Jacoby Bird spent a year and a half going out. Kristen from Water Department has spent hours going around to community. We have the aqueduct that's at all the events, talking about water, saving water. We have incentives such as Spokanescape, all the attachments that you can get from the city that are free that'll save you um, money and water. So we are doing that. Do we need to do more? Sure. But to say that we're not doing that now or not doing enough, um, we can always do more. But I, I do want to commend our staff that's mm -hmm. been out there and working tirelessly and talking to people and people are responding. They're saying, yeah, this, this makes sense. This isn't a burden. And guess what? Your grass is still going to be green if you only water it four times a week. It, vegetable gardens and growing food is exempt. Watering trees, exempt. New landscapes, exempt. It's that three months of the year when we're out there watering our lawns at noon that's really costing us. And it's costing us in terms of having to build more infrastructure, as you said, more infrastructure that is extremely expensive. We don't need to do that. We can be smart about this. And we can save ourselves some money in the process. So thank you, right. Kara. Thank you, Jacoby. All right. Okay, so explain this. The vote is... The vote, if you vote yes, you're voting to override the veto and okay. put the ordinance into, into place. Okay. Okay. Prepare to vote. Okay, that passes five to one. And that is, brings us to the end of the legislative agenda. I'm gonna call a 10 minute break uh, and then we'll come back and we'll start at 827 by that clock on open forum. We have dozens of people who wanna talk at open forum. So I will see you then.
it's scary. All right, I'm going to gavel us back into order. We're a few minutes later than I expected. So I'm going to start calling people's names, and I'm going to try to call people three at a time. So if you're going to be next up, if you kind of make your way down to one of the closer seats, it'll just go faster, and we'll have less time people walking. We'll try to get as many people in as we can. We uh, go to 9.30 under council rules unless um, there's a vote of four people to extend beyond that. So uh, keep it as uh, close to the point as possible, and we would love to hear as many perspectives as possible. So if other people have said what you're going to say, say, say something different. So, But anyway, we're super glad to see you. Uh, looks like most of you are from the Leita Valley, so it's great to see you here. Uh, and it's great to see you all organized. I remember going to neighborhood council meetings with to be like four people. So uh, you got some things on your mind, so that's great. So let's. Uh, so the first three are going to be and it's not all about Leita Valley, but first is John Repsold, if you're here, come on down. And then Barbara Papke and Sheila Parpolik, and my apologies if I'm not getting your name right. But And again, up to three minutes. John, welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening. I spent nearly 50 years of my life living in Spokane and raising six children and now a dozen grandchildren. I've served Spokane in the religious and educational sector for over 30 years, the last 15 years in the downtown church called Mosaic Fellowship. We serve the thousands of mostly low-income downtown residents that need meaningful community and deserve to have a spiritual family within walking distance. And until relatively recently, being in the, in the downtown core has been a great experience. But as you're well aware, in the past two years, the homeless population has significantly changed that dynamic. The situation has grown markedly more dangerous, more drug-dominated, more violent, more confrontational and less inviting for families, children, and adults alike who want to see our downtown thrive. In short, significant segments of downtown are dying and is due in large part to the presence of large numbers of homeless people who use our sidewalks, building entrances, open spaces, and underpasses as their bedrooms, living rooms, and bathrooms. As we all know, homelessness is not a simple issue. It has many causes and no easy solutions. But the last 15 years of serving and interacting with the homeless has convinced me that there are a handful of dominant factors contributing to why most of our homeless are living on the streets. First, drug and alcohol addictions are rampant. Second, mental health issues abound. Third, relational isolation resulting from both of these previous factors is compounding the problem. And fourth, surprisingly to many, uh, too many of the homeless actually prefer living on the street in order to maintain their perceived independence rather than embrace most of the alternatives that we as a city would prefer to see them choose. In short, we cannot force the homeless to choose alternatives that may, in fact, be in their best interest. We must always respect their dignity as fellow human beings created by God, but we cannot afford to cede the ownership, use, and safety of our streets to those who have demonstrated little interest in the long-term health and success of our city. So I'm appealing to you, our city leaders, to act now in moving forward with the Trent Avenue shelter option. The city must start somewhere, and this is a reasonable and needed place to begin. Finally, there are dozens of in incredible organizations and hundreds of dedicated and gifted people that have been working tirelessly for years to address homelessness and to deal with the people involved with dignity. From first responders to nonprofits, businesses to social agencies, these, this community is rich in dedication and compassion. Please listen to them. Please consult with them. Please learn from all of us most of whom have made plenty of mistakes from which we would like to spare you. As we, we as a city cannot afford to get this one wrong any longer. In the past, we are past midnight on this crisis. We must act with wisdom, compassion, determination, and love for everyone who calls Spokane home. And we must act now. Please approve this needed step in the Trent Shelter immediately. And I want to thank you for your service on behalf of all Spokaneites. Many of us pray regularly for you. May God guide each of you as you lead this wonderful city. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next, Barbara Papke, then Sheila Parpolik, and then John Johnson. Hi. Uh, Hi, President welcome. Beggs and council members. I'm here because I have great concerns about all the development on the Leita Valley that's uh, been ongoing. We moved here almost 20 years ago, and it's constantly been building, building up. Um, 
I just want to focus on safety on the highway because I know there's other people who are going to speak to other issues. But I was involved in a life-threatening accident on 195. And I see it every day when I watch the J-turns that are executed improperly. People who dart out from 16th Street trying to get beat the traffic coming so they get first in line on the freeway on ramp. And it's getting to be really hazardous. And there's been several deaths on that highway. And from where I sit at my house, I can see the intersection of Meadow Lane and 195 and saw a little girl go flying off a motorcycle with her, with her dad and she was killed because somebody pulled out. So I think there needs to be, and I've talked with Washington State Department of Transportation and they say, well, they can't handle the roads that come into the highway. They can only handle the highway. And it's the city's responsibility to deal with the roads that go into the highway. So I'm hoping that there will be some kind of changes made they, people, when I talk to people in the uh, city, they say, well, we can't put any stop signs. We can't put a stop light. It's a highway. But if you travel west on Highway 2, there's speed limits down to 35. There's stop lights. There are all kinds of measures to ensure safety. There are no measures on that highway to ensure safety of the citizens traveling there. And I think it's great that in a week you were able to stop a landslide in Happy Valley or Peaceful Valley. But it's, I've been there 17 years, and nothing has happened to change the safety on that highway. So that's what I'm hoping for in this meeting. I know other people have other issues. I have a lot of other issues too but with this development, but I'm gonna let them speak to that. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, next, Sheila, and then John Johnson, and Dana Smith. Hello, my name is Sheila Parpolia. <clears throat> I have lived in the Grandview neighborhood for the past 25 years. Currently, there are proposals for approximately 1,000 homes to be built within a one-mile radius of my home. I wrote a letter of concern in March when I heard of the first proposal for the 96 homes, the Grandview addition, to be built in the wilderness area behind my house. The engineer has designed a way to get out of each subdivision, but once out of the subdivision, everyone will be using the same narrow roads to get to Highway 195 and Sunset Boulevard. Soon the Grandview neighborhood will be banned from left turn access on 195 via 16th Avenue, which is how we are able to access the freeway. This presents a huge problem and due to poor planning, everyone will be routed one way or the other to Sunset Boulevard. The other option is to drive south to da the dangerous J turn to go back north to the metered lights to get on the freeway, which is often backed up past the J turn. Sunset is a one-lane road going east and is already very congested. Think of adding a thousand more cars to get our kids to school on the South Hill or to get to work on, in Airway Heights downtown, north, or to the valley. To get on the freeway, we would have to use the Maple Street on-ramp, which is already too congested to handle the traffic getting on or coming from the freeway. Why isn't there another way for our neighborhood, Grandview, to get on the freeway going east? I worry if there is an emergency, how will emergency vehicles get to us and will they be there in time? What if a situation like recently happened in Boulder, Colorado happens? How will all of our neighbors get out safely? <clears throat> the Boulder fire started as a brush fire, then turned into an inferno that burned down more than a thousand houses. Those neighbors were in fear for their lives, as well as the lives of their pets and livestock and their homes. If a fire like that happened in a 195 corridor, how would everyone escape? Would they, get a, would they get out of their neighborhoods or be backed up on 195 trying to get somewhere? Why hasn't other infrastructure been completed prior to this? We've all been good neighbors. We pay our taxes, have our skids, kids bus to schools on the South Hill, and have nothing in our area to support all of these new homes going in. Due to poor planning, the city is now having to put Band-Aids everywhere. J-turns, roundabouts, reroutes to the same couple of roads is not solving the problem. The city needs to come up with long-term solutions to the problems that we have prior to building new homes and making things worse and more dangerous. Please take a look at the big picture and take a drive to see what is being proposed <coughs> along 195. Finally, I would like to thank Lori Kinnear for reading my March letter and taking a drive through our neighborhood to see what I was trying to explain about the escape routes and lack of emergency access. A very special thanks to Karen Stratton for taking the time to tour around with Molly Marshall and I 
<clears throat> to really see where these proposed subdivisions are are up close Sheila, and the safety concerns. We're at we're past oh, time. I was just like had a... <laughs> we got a lot of people. One more sentence. Okay. All right. Anyway, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. All right. John. John Johnson. Are you here? Come on up. And after John is Dana Smith and then Sheila Rawls. Good evening. My name is John Johnson. Our family have been residents of the Grandview neighborhood for more than 30 years. I am speaking in support of the movement to provide reliable infrastructure, especially streets before development. In Grandview, as some of you, I understand, have now seen, there is one access in and out of the area. If fire, if due to fire or other disaster, there is a blockage of West 17th, east of the West 16th and Grandview Avenue three-way intersection, three to 400 people would be trapped and no one could get to them. This, of course, is an enormous, unspeakable safety hazard. Adding nearly 300 more homes, or which is, equates to roughly 700 to 800 people, to the area without providing an additional access route sets up a catastrophe, potentially. Similar situation, situation could exist on Thorpe Road with the proposed 500 home development, which is 1,300 people, which is basically a town the size of a Waterville, a Grand Coulee, or a Pomeroy. Should a fire sweep in from the southwest and block uh, westbound access on Thorpe to assembly, the only escape route from Thorpe would be eastbound to Highway 195 or even Marshall Road as a workaround. In that case, you have to go through two one-lane, 100-plus-year-old tunnels. If one of those got blocked, there's no way out for possibly 2,000 people living on the Thorpe Corridor, and that's pretty frightening. Uh, I do, we do have a unique opportunity to avoid the pitfalls that have gridlocked much of King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties when population growth ran far ahead of their infrastructure resources in the 1990s and early 2000s. We have that opportunity, but we, we cannot wait, however, by putting the well-being of the people already here uh, while we are waiting. The single access risk I described for Thorpe and Grandview is quite real, will not be fixed unless we act and do so. Uh, I do want to finally say that uh, I suggest we need to plan things much better this is our chance. It's right here. It's in front of us. We can do it better than others have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, John. Uh, Dana Smith, after Dana, Sheila Rawls, and then Leslie Hope. I would like to address the City Council tonight to consider those of us, the citizens, that live in the Lataw Creek and surrounding area. Many of us chose to live there because not only the close proximity to the city, but because of the wildlife in that area. Um, we love the birds and the moose and the deer and the coyotes and the porcupines, the raccoons, the skunks. We, it's great. We just love the lifestyle that we have out there. And when we originally moved there, my husband and I, 30 years ago, we were told that the area between 17th and 21st and D Street and H Street, that that was donated to the city and it would never be sold. It was a, to be a park. That has not been proven true. The city did sell it and then it's been resold. So <clears throat> my confidence in the city is not very great. Also at the end of our street, 21st, that was a wetland, it was a pond. And we would have, um, we'd, I'd take the kids out there and we would listen to the frogs and the toads and it was beautiful, it was wonderful. That has been sold, privately of course, and then um, bulldozed down so it's no longer a wetland, but it's a, now they're going to, they propose to put 183 homes at the end of that in that small area. Um, it seems like the bird population is declining as people are um, cutting down their trees, and I think some consideration might be for the city to um, propose or recommend people when they do cut down their trees, maybe replace it with a smaller tree. I know that there's windstorms and people maybe cut those huge trees, which host huge amounts of birds in them, and I know they cut them down because it, they're dangerous during those windstorms. 
So I see both sides of the coin, but I think maybe like the water, maybe just a little bug in people's ears that they could plant other trees to help with the coming, the drought that we're in. We need those trees and they're disappearing, especially with all this development that we're seeing in our area now. I'm asking for some thoughtful consideration to the needs of the people as well as the animals. It is up to us as caretakers of the earth to use wisdom and restraint. Perhaps a more thorough study on the future growth plans in our city, city is in order. I know that the tax, the potential tax revenue for the city is a luscious temptation, but at what cost to the quality of all of our lives? I do realize that growth is inevitable. I do realize that this is a complex problem for the city. I also realize that infrastructure is of a primary concern before moving forward with more development. When queried, the developers in these areas, we have three, well, actually Dana, four major developments. We're, we're past okay. your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming down. Uh, Sheila Rawls, and then after Sheila, Leslie Hope, and then Sam. Hey, go. Good evening. I'm Sheila Rawls. I live in Grandview, and I'm here to ask you to consider a temporary moratorium on the major development in Leita Valley. Uh, we, we need to do necessary strategic planning. Uh, we can clarify the needs of this growing vibrant area, and we can identify funding sources to provide the proper infrastructure, including possibly impact fees for developers that are already there. When I was getting ready to retire from the federal government in Washington, D.C. in 2015, I made a list of all the cities and all the things that I would like to have in a retirement community. And then I went out and I visited every one of those, those cities. I came to Spokane in 2015. I fell in love with Spokane. Anywhere in the world that I could live, I chose Spokane. It's a wonderful, beautiful place, and I want to make this my home. You don't have to walk very far from the city hall, even to see world-class development parks with the uh, river that's been revitalized to make cleaner and safer, beautiful outdoor pavilion. All of this is the result of strategic planning. All of this is. When you add the estimated 2,000 units already permitted or pending permits in the Leita Valley area, you add that to an already existing population, you could be talking about four to 5,000 additional residents in that area. That's the size of a city. In fact, 75% of all cities in, in incorporated areas, or un, in incorporated areas in the United States are 5,000 people or less. Mm -hmm. They have fire, they have police, they have libraries, they have schools, they have infrastructure. And that's what we're asking of you, to consider that, making this infrastructure decision. I would imagine there are things that you're dealing with on your plate right now as council members that perhaps if decisions had been made a long time ago and strategic planning had been done, you wouldn't have to deal with some of these issues. You're having to play a bit of a catch up. You're good leaders, you love this city, and I, I really beg you to take a look at the ramifications of this kind of growth in Leita Valley without that strategic planning. You're wise, you make good decisions, you know what's right to do. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, next is Leslie Hope, and then Sam Hagel, and then Paulette Hagel. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, um, thanks for hearing us out. Um, my name is Leslie Hope, and I live in the Grandview Thorpe neighborhood. And um, on 9-11, um, I was standing in my office overlooking the Pentagon when the plane hit it and the flyer burst in the air. And I literally sat there and watched everything go into slow motion and a giant disaster unfold in the city of Washington, D.C. And I don't mean to be getting um, dramatic, but as I sit in, in the back of my uh, Grandview home and I look at the city, I can see I-95, I-90, all of downtown, all the way to the Fitch Arboretum, all the way to South Hill, that incredible view. I'm starting to see things slow down and I'm starting to see this catastrophe unfold. 
And perhaps, I mean, you're, everything you've heard tonight is all true, but I wanna to talk to you only being here for six years a little bit about the process. So I start driving up 17th and I see a big red sign that says, oh, Wilkerson Consulting is having, these engineers are having a development and traffic stop meeting. So I go to this meeting and it becomes very clear to me that this is a box check exercise. And for, I don't know exactly how city planning works in this city yet, but I can tell you I've been through bureaucracies long enough to understand exactly what was going on. We're going through a little check of what the people have to say about this project. And that there are 16 projects on the books now, and all of them are going through the same box checks and 12 houses, a traffic study is not going to say anything about. But when you get 16 projects with hundreds and hundreds of homes behind them, they're going to really have a huge impact. My challenge or my ask is don't look at these projects individually. Look at them holistically and do comprehensive planning um, for this area so that we don't set a foundation for now and future growth that is on very shaky ground. Um, please enact a moratorium until we have the time to look at this comprehensively and come up with a plan that will address all of these concerns, including the very real danger that if a fire comes up in that neighborhood, we have no way out. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Leslie. All right, next is Sam Hagel, and then Paulette Hagel, and then I believe Lamar Danielle. Any Hagels still here? Okay. Is Lamar here? Okay, all right, not seeing Lamar. Okay, Becky Von Kevlin. And after Becky is Kai Hauschke and uh, Adam Marshall. Hello, President Beggs Hi. and council members. My name is Becky Van Kulen, and I have lived in the Leita area for about 15 years, and I am very invested in this community. I run a nonprofit, Cancer Cant, and serve cancer patients. Um, but I'm here tonight for my local community. Um, previously, I worked for a housing development company and am pro-development and understand that you guys, like, we're in a housing crisis, and this is a tough situation as we're sitting here asking for a moratorium, but this area that we're talking about is not low income housing. This is much uh, higher end housing and is not part of that problem. The Department of Transportation has asked for a moratorium in this area and have recognized the safety issues with 195 and the freeway and, and have asked that we deal with this issue before we continue to develop this area. So I just want you to consider that. Um, and also considering impact fees on development. So as these developers are coming in and asking for, you know, to build all of these houses, there are ways that we can start paying for some of this infrastructure that we are asking for, like schools and the, the roads and the, the issues with the traffic safety. So I just wanted to uh, quote you, President Beggs, because you had, when you guys were talking about the water issues, you had mentioned a uh, shortage of infrastructure. And so you guys were just talking about that. And so we just want to put that in front of you to say, let's plan ahead with this and, and think of that beforehand. So thank you. Thank you. Next is Kai. And then after Kai, Adam Marshall, then Sarah Marshall. Uh, thanks, Council. Thanks for being awake still. It's a late night. Um, I'm Kai Hushka. I've lived down in the Leita Valley area since 2008. Um, currently the chair of the Ta Hangman Neighborhood Council. Uh, but what came uh, abundantly clear just from individual conversations and talking to other neighborhoods is that the, uh, the push to get recognition for the realities of that area were not, uh, not rising to any kind of level of, of importance. So myself and a couple other people formed a new group. We call ourselves Citizen Action for Leita Valley. Um, interestingly enough, it feels like we're starting to get some more conversations, some more time, some more, um, I guess, momentum towards what you've been hearing here tonight, and we'll hear a few more um, people talk before we end. 
Um, I think a couple things to point out in some of my conversations that I've had with each of you or some of you individually, uh, there's been responses that a moratorium just isn't necessary, that the DOT and their position and the authority of uh, regulating traffic along 195, that's, that's sufficient enough to sort of slow the pace of development. And to a degree, that has been the case. <coughs> um, however, as each of you are aware, once developments go through the process, once they vest past a certain point, uh, things like impact fees become moot, for instance, or the reality of the, of the comprehensive planning also become moot. Uh, when those projects eventually get clearance, get to go ahead, uh, they go under the existing uh, scheme that we have now, uh, which I think uh, you've been hearing as well is, is largely inadequate for what uh, people are expecting. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation tonight through the parades, through uh, other issues that have come up just around the quality of life and what makes Spokane Spokane. And all of that, I think, is very much in jeopardy uh, in the sense of where this could all head. Uh, and I found it very interesting that even with the DOT operating in the manner that they have in the sense of having some oversight about what gets built, uh, I'd say in the last four months, there's been a huge uptick in the amount of development proposals that have come into the development stream. And I'm not a developer, but I would assume if you're gonna get involved in the process, uh, you're there because you think you can make it through the process in order to do the developing that you wanted to develop. Uh, you're not gonna get involved in a process that may drag out for 10 years with some outcome that you don't know the answer to. So that leaves me very suspicious that there's a sense that things are going to move, who knows what's happening where, politically speaking, and I think that has a lot of people alarmed for all the reasons that you've been hearing so far and that you'll hear uh, when we conclude here tonight, uh, that there really needs to be a more comprehensive understanding of what's happening there. Uh, there's a huge number of infrastructure-related issues uh, that need to be addressed, whether it's public transportation. I was involved in another group that helped preserve some of the land down there from, from development. Uh, the Coeur d'Alene Tribe has now taken that over. Uh, there's a huge amount of actually agricultural land uh, that I think needs to be protected as well. So there's a lot of reasons, I think, to push the pause button here, and uh, you guys have the ability to do that. Thank you. Thanks, Kai. Um, next, Adam Marshall, then Sarah Marshall, then Michael McKay. Good evening, uh, Council President Beggs, Council. Uh, my name's Adam Marshall. I, uh, I live in uh, Leitau Valley. Uh, I was uh, a little nervous about coming, uh, and then I realized uh, we actually, as Spokane residents and people who love this city, uh, share a lot of the same core values. And uh, I think the Pacific Northwest is a beautiful place. I mean, it clearly is, and it's why people choose it. Uh, Spokane can be a city that offer, offers a quality of life to its citizens, safety, sustainability, and access to employment and education and a good community. And it does that now, but will it in the future? And will it do that for Laytop Valley? And that is the question. Laytop Valley has been largely a forgotten area of Spokane City. Until recently, that has not all been bad. Uh, but that's been due to its low density. With density, there is a giant significant problem that now is rearing its head in many different ways. The lack of infrastructure in Laytop Valley is actually shocking. Absent of the benefit of comprehensive future planning and inadequate funding to improve the situation. Unless this council acts now with a moratorium, none of the following facts will ever improve. 100% of the students of Laytop Valley will continue to not attend school in Laytop Valley, relying on busing or private transportation for their needs to get to school. The number of fire department vehicles actually located in the valley will remain a single truck which is not a class one, two, or three engine. It is a brush truck, in the, in the words of the fire chief himself. The fire threat to us is real and the present danger to our valley. Additional homes and a distinct lack of evacuation routes only further complicate this danger, dangerous situation. Additionally, Leita Valley uh, does not have the option anywhere to walk to school, to walk to a library, to, to go to a community center, to visit a police precinct, to utilize public transportation. The reason is none of these exist in Laytop Valley. Additionally, 82% uh, and a growing number of Hata Hangman Leita citizens uh, do not live within 10 minutes of a park. And with more citizens, that number is only gonna go up. Laytop Valley's ability to access other parts of the city will also continue to decline further. Restricting access to the valley's main arterial is already well underway for the neighborhoods that use it with entry points being blocked and diverted into J-turns. 
We are, we are being asked to trade one problem for another as a city. Our access to 195 is already being restricted. Where are those cars now being diverted into other neighborhoods that should concern District 2 especially? We have people that are gonna be pouring into the West Hills if these additional homes are gonna happen. We have additional people being routed through Brown's addition if Inland, Inland Empire Way gets finished, which it is not, and there's millions of dollars involved in that. Business as usual is not Adam, working here. You're at the end of your three minutes. All right. Thanks. For, Thanks for And feel free to come back. Um, Sarah Marshall, Michael McKay, and then McKenna Marshall. Um, hi, Welcome. I'm Sarah Marshall. I also live in the Grandview Thorpe neighborhood. Um, I have lived in Spokane for almost all of my life, and I've witnessed its growth year after year. I am now currently a student in college, and every time I come back, I see more of the land, the trails, these beautiful wetlands, these woodlands. Every time I come back, they have been bulldozed and replaced with homes. I am not against development. I think it's necessary, but the way that it has been undergone is just, it's, it's frankly an insult to the people already living there, you know? I, will, I want to refrain from sounding like a broken record here, but there is an issue with quality of life and lack of infrastructure. As, as a young person, as a former child, I'll say, um, I had no access to a library, to public transportation. I couldn't ride my bike anywhere. All of my friends lived on the South Hill and I had no access to them. Uh, and that was because both my parents worked full time. I, I could not ask them to sacrifice their time to drive me somewhere. My observations are not unique, and I realize that they're echoed by many of my fellow uh, members of the Citizens Action Council for Layton Valley, but it's, it's a problem. We want this to change. I realize it's not in, uh, there are issues. We have the housing crisis. We have issues with homelessness. We have an influx of people who have decided in recent years that Spokane is the place to live. And we understand that. It is an excellent place to live, but we want to preserve that. If we don't take these steps, it's not going to be a good place to live. It's not. We are presenting you with this choice. You can take action, which is infinitely better than the alternative. Don't take the easy way out. We realize that it's going to cost a lot of money, a lot of time, and it's going to take a lot to build infrastructure in our neighborhoods. But if you don't, if if you, as the leaders of our community, choose not to take these actions, you're going to ruin our city and everything about it that makes it a good place to live. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, Michael McKay. Michael here. Not seeing Michael. Uh, McKenna Marshall, then Molly Marshall and Russell Neff. Hello, I'm McKenna Marshall. I live in the Grandview Thorpe neighborhood and I currently attend Lewis and Clark High School. Today I'm here to talk about my transportation, transportation struggle with myself along many other student bus drivers, or riders. I can say commuting to the South Hill every day due to no other available schools throughout Leitaw Valley has always been a hassle. This is specifically due to the unreliable bus system that would leave my family in ongoing predicaments. Not to mention my fellow classmates' commute times of a few minutes greatly contrasted to my 45 minute to non-existent bus rides each morning and afternoon. In fact, I remember several occasions where I was left waiting for what seemed like eternity or simply just not being picked up. That being, even when I was picked up, our route would stop in Eagle Ridge Granby Thorpe, Sunset Hill, and even sometimes Laytaw Creek, forcing me to wake up hours before school and not getting home before many other kids did. It also should be mentioned that solutions to this problem consist of offering kids free public bus passes, yet the const or closest stop from my house is a mile away. To me, it's extremely concerning living in the Grandview Thorpe neighborhood and seeing these problems continue. That is why I support CALV in the infrastructure before development cause. Leitaw Valley is not only unfit for more housing, but also cannot handle transportation before education. 
If there were schools to be built and a plan for change, it would be a different story. But for now, a moratorium should be required to fix this relevant issue. Thank you. Thank you, McKenna. Uh, Molly Marshall, followed by Russell Neff, followed by David Brown Eagle. Good evening. Um, it's the Marshall Show. <laughs> I'm Molly Marshall and I live in Grandview Thorpe and I've lived there for about 20 years and I am a member of the Citizen Action for Lake Tahoe Valley. And I wanted to start by thanking council members Kinnear and Wilkerson for representing our district and answering our emails, taking our phone calls, meetings, and working behind the scenes to find a solution to the issues in our neighborhoods. Thank you, council member Stratton, for taking over three hours to tour our neighborhoods and see the issues in person. For council member Sapone, thank you for meeting in person to discuss the moratorium. Thank you, President Biggs, for fielding phone calls and answering emails. I especially want to thank Mike Gribner and his staff from Washtop for recognizing the safety issues on US 195 and 190, I-90 for more than three years ago and calling for a moratorium. Mike has met with Calv, attended neighborhood meetings, and fielded personal phone calls and emails on this issue. And I want to thank him for being a part of the solution. I'd also like to thank Chief Schaefer, Fire Marshal Dahl, Firefighter Marler, and the Firefighters Union for taking time to listen and engage on the issue of fire protection in the Leta Valley. For SBS Superintendent Dr. Swinyard, thank you for taking time to meet with Calv and discuss development issues, its impact on our schools, and the lack of schools in Leta Valley. For Garrett Jones and Nick Ahmad, thank you for sharing your ideas and thanks and thoughts about the future of our parks, protecting natural areas, and identifying undes unserved areas within the Leta Valley and the city. For Spencer Gardner, thank you for meeting with us to discuss the rapid development in the Leta Valley. Thank you, Michelle Pappas, for F at FutureWise, for providing training and guidance and advocacy for the moratorium. Thank you to Maggie Yates for publicly supporting the call for a moratorium. But I finally want to thank <clears throat> the citizens of Lake Tahoe Valley for making a choice, getting involved, and deciding to take action. Please stand. Over 1,060 people from Eagle Ridge, Qualchin Hills, Vinegar Flats, Grandview Thorpe, Hangman Valley, and all other neighborhoods in the Leita Valley have signed a petition asking for a moratorium to pause development in the Leita Valley until planning and funding can put infrastructure in place to ensure the safety and well-being of its current, current residents. It is with the overwhelming support from this group that I present the moratorium we are proposing. I have copies for everyone. It is time for you to take action. Put the politi politics aside and help your citizens of Leita Valley. Put infrastructure before development. Thank you. Thank you, Molly, and for finishing right on time. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Neff here, Russell, I, don't, I think he's gone. Uh, Dave Brown Eagle, not seeing him. Uh, Joshua Awesome, over here. Alfonso Calderon, Alfonso, come on back. And after that, as Ken Van Vorks, I think, and then Drea Giardo. President and honorable council members, thank you for this time. God, I feel like such a burden. <laughs> really, I'm coming to you tonight because I'm planning on retiring and moving here. <laughs> okay. uh, I came here the first time in 74 for the World's Fair, and I just fell in love with the water. I just, you know, coming from, La I live in West Covina, California, mm -hmm. and just, I'd never seen so much water. I even, my family would say, quit staring at it, mm -hmm. you know. Then uh, friends moved up in 2000 and showed me that house where Benny and June was shot. You don't want to live in Peaceful Valley. I should have bought that house, mm -hmm. not realizing. And I figured, okay, when I retire, I'll come here. Little did I know, 20 years later, well, nothing is what it cost 20 years ago. So I am looking to think outside the box, if there's tiny homes, if I'm kind of interested in Cascade Mobile Home Park, I've been redeveloped three times in my life and I'm not ready for that again. If, do, or is redevelopment an issue? Maybe it will be someday, you know. 
but um, if there's anybody that could help as far as senior housing, I mean, I'm not looking for free, but I am looking for a deal or something. And I just uh, spend some time with some cousins up near Deer Park. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, to me to drive 14 miles to them, it was like, God, that's clear out of town. And I thought, this is nothing. I don't mind 14 miles. Mm -hmm. Though we are divided by miles and states, unhoused, fire, and water it seems like it's always going to be an issue. So thank you guys. I know it's completely different, but, uh, you know, I hope everyone figures it out. You guys have such good synergy. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, is Ken here, Van Verks? Or I might be getting your name wrong, so please come down and introduce yourself. After that, Drea Gallardo and then Jennifer Hicks. Oh, and who are you? Joshua. Sorry, Joshua. Joshua's first. Come on. I didn't. Thanks for letting me know. No Joshua, awesome. Hello. Uh, my name's Joshua. I've been uh, a na uh, living in the Grandview neighborhood as a homeowner for about 11 years now. A uh, few concerns that I've experienced since I got here, especially with what is being um, brought up to our attention with this construction is uh, the first issue is the destruction of the wetlands at the end of 21st Street. Uh, so I have spent many hours wandering through the woods that are just gorgeous. There's so many trails. Most of these areas are what they are trying to um, build upon. But we had a wetland area which was approximately a, a full block length at the end of 21st. Um, so many birds and animals use this wetland. And this year was the first year that I noticed it didn't exist. It's completely gone. Um, so all the pussy willows and stuff that would be growing out of it, there, it's, it's, I can't, it's beyond my comprehension. Um, at night we will listen to the frogs. Um, and it just seems like all the magic of our neighborhood is getting destroyed. Um, I, yeah, it's something beyond my, I didn't expect this to happen in my neighborhood. Uh, so for infrastructure uh, roads, I mean, we, we really do only have this one narrow road in and out of our neighborhood. One of the major challenges with that particular road is there's no sidewalk. Um, so at sunset every single day, as you're driving up it, um, it's really scary to accidentally not hit people or wildlife because there's, there, it's just so narrow, you can't see cars, you can't see people, uh, and there's been many times that I have almost hit somebody in that point, um, just cresting that hill. It's a very long hill, about 0.75 miles, um, just a long, long stretch. So big issue. Another th issue that I've experienced with the construction is that um, some of these developers wanted to build very, very small lot sizes. So a lot of home maximizing what they got. And I remember on one of the plans, uh, a few of the houses were on uh, 5,000 square foot lots, which is very small, especially for our neighborhood. My, my property, I think, is 13,000. So just much, much smaller. It just doesn't make any sense. They were describing they were going to use dynamite for basically flattening the top of the mountain behind my house. Um, all kinds of issues with that. I have a feeling that might have been a cause of why we don't have wetlands on the other end. So currently we have about 200 houses in our entire neighborhood and directly here they're trying to add another 400 or more all in this tiny little neighborhood. So I, with my neighbors, are asking for a moratorium on building in the Lake Tahoe Valley. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joshua. All right, Ken. And after Ken is uh, Drea and then Jennifer. Councilman Beggs, thank you, um, and Council. Um, my name is Ken Van Voris. I live at 1923 South Audubon Court in the Grandview neighborhood. These folks have talked a lot about the infrastructure, and that's where I'm really concerned. Um, <clears throat> with that said, the, uh, the one thing that hasn't been pointed out is that we live next to um, 95 and I-90 and a major rail line that transports a lot of things that we're not sure is there. We know whether it's oil, coal, and whatever else they're transporting across this country. We're within this whole neighborhood and these developments are within one mile of that, that rail line. Should there be an accident, 
This infrastructure uh, parts and pieces that you're talking about is very challenging. It really is um, a problem. It's pinch points. There's three of them in the Grandview neighborhood. I'm sure there's many others in the other neighborhoods as well. So I really encourage you to take a look at this. I appreciate the council that has come up and taken a uh, walk and, and done the tours. Um, it is a real concern. It's a concern for our families. It's a concern for our neighbors. And we can do a better job. We really can. So I ask you to take a look at this. I really encourage you to consider this because the sad thing is a development happened I'm going to say 15 years ago when we first built our home up there. That development today is still, I call it the open pit mine. The Canyon Bluffs is a travesty to the West Plains. They devastated the landscape and now it's blank and it's just vacant. Um, we call it the land of the lost. You can go down there and just wander around. They still have the housing, uh, or the, excuse me, the apartment foundation holes, but it's just terrible. When you're on 14th looking across to the West, here's this big massive scar on our hillside. So I ask you to really consider this wholeheartedly. You have the tools, you have the ability to do this. So please consider looking at the development holistically. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ken. All right, Drea and then Jennifer Hook Kicks and then Steve Bush. Uh. Good evening. Um, so uh, I am Andrea Gallardo. I'm the co-founder of Mac Movement. Many of you might have seen us out there doing free food with a side of free speech. We're out here every Monday trying to make it um, a comfortable environment for people to come and speak and use their freedom of speech. Um, uh, I am a descendant of the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene tribe. Um, I've always been taught to listen to our elders, and um, elder had put an ask out to speak up to encourage, to protect the aquifer and the river for the future generations. For five years now, uh, a little bit longer than that, my nonprofit, Mac Movement, has been doing the free food with the cider free speech, and it's still a little scary to kind of get up here and speak in front of you guys. But sometimes that's what we got to do. We got to do what we have to do. And I hope that you guys are listening to these people uh, in the community that are telling you their needs. And um, I hope that you guys listen and not just listen, but also act. Um, um, many of you might not know, but these lands here are really sacred to the indigenous people. Um, just right here, there's the gathering stone, and that's where the Native people used to gather to fish and to trade. And um, uh, uh, also, I don't know if you know, but Leita used to be Hangsman Creek, and Leita actually means fish. Um, I have a few asks. Um, one of the asks is if you would put, I've actually asked this before, but if we could put the open forum to the beginning, a lot of people had left and so you're missing out on community's testimony. And so if we can move the open forum to the beginning, because you guys are here and you guys are getting paid and a lot of us are here on our own time and missing out on time with our families. Um, my other ask is if we could maybe put up a Spokane tribal flag. I don't know if that's ever been asked before. And also if we can incorporate a land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like you all to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional and sacred homelands we inhabit, the Spokane tribe. As a direct descendant, it's my honor to recognize the Spokane tribe and pay respect to tribal elders, both past and present, as well as indigenous people today. This land holds their DNA and culture. So be grateful you're on these sacred lands. We give thanks to the legacy of the original people and their descendants, and we should pledge to honor the people and the land. Um, and if I need to, I can start a petition for these asks, but I just hope that you guys take this into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Hicks and then Steve Bush and Wendy Powell. It's Jennifer Hicks here. I don't see Jennifer Hicks. Steve Bush, after Steve Bush, Wendy Powell, and then DJ Ingram. Ingram. I'm going to second that, uh, putting the, uh, the public forum first. Uh, you guys have a lot more comfortable chairs than we do out here. So, uh, give me a moment. I'll have to put my readers on so I can read. Um, 
I've uh, edited my comments because I was originally going to talk about the what we can't talk about. Um, so I would like to address uh, three things that are already in place, um, which would be the Spokane Water City Water Conservation Master Plan, the WaterWise program, and portions of the sustainable. Um, I can't remember. It's just, the SAP, sustainable. Action plan. Help me out here. Sustainable action plan. Yes. Action okay. So anyway, um, according to, and I want to address the uh, low flow issues and the aquifer, and those are uh, longstanding issues. Nothing relevant to um, the ordinance today. Um, according to the Spokane Valley Rathdrum and Prairie Aquifer Atlas. The Spokane Valley Rathdrum Prairie by State Aquifer Study, the Spokane Aquifer Joint Board, Joint Board Studies, excuse me, low flows in the Spokane River are directly related to the hydrology of Lake Coeur d'Alene. The Spokane River's gaining and losing reaches in relation to the aquifer itself, as well as flow controls at the Post Falls Dam. The council and other members of our community like to compare Spokane's water use to other regions. For the record, Spokane is not Las Vegas, and the council has no valid reason to insist that we reduce our water by 25%, which is in these other plans. <clears throat> the SVRP is currently and has remained at or above historic levels. It's recharged at a rate of nearly a billion gallons a day. Go look at the river outside the door here. The aquifer contains 10 trillion gallons of water. The Spokane region does not have now, nor will ever have, a water shortage. But in these plans that have already been adopted by the city council, we are told that we have to reduce our water use by 25%. Why have we been told that? And I thank the LATOP people for mentioning infrastructure many times. It is the responsibility of the council to ensure that Spokane has the infrastructure we need to sustain growth and to provide water to the residents. Yet you have chosen not to increase or spend any money on infrastructure, but to limit the citizens of our city Water use. Steve, we're, we're at your three minutes. Your time's up. For I am already. Yep. Wow. But you can come back. I'll come back. Thanks. And then, so Steve was from Mead, and then Wendy Powell, I think, is from Valley Ford, and then DJ Ingram. Is Wendy here? Okay. DJ Ingram. Um, last name Christensen. Not seeing the first name. Is Cindy Zapataki Z here still? I don't think. Yep, there you are. You switch seats. Come on down. So I understand I can talk about two different subjects here in one night? Yeah, so you can, at open forum, you can talk about anything that wasn't on our legislative agenda. Okay. Um, I came to talk about the, go the mayor's veto, and we were told we could not speak yeah. at that time. Yeah, so you, you can't talk about that tonight. You can come any other night and talk about the mayor's veto, but you can't talk but about But why that. couldn't we talk during your consideration? Because we don't usually do that for uh, veto overrides, and so we had a discussion and a vote on that earlier today. Oh, you agreed we couldn't speak, because I had uh, emailed... Uh, my representative Wilkerson and asked if we would be able to speak to the issue, and she emailed me that we would our voice would be heard. Well, she I'm not sure when she emailed you, but in our briefing session we had a vote and we didn't have a, enough votes to have a testimony on that. We don't okay. usually do that. Okay, so I'll just take my testimony home, I guess. Okay, we'll Thanks. come back another time. Thanks. And can I comment? And, and thank you for that. That was just decided today not to have testimony, not when I emailed you. I thought that was going to be the case. So my apologies for that. All right, next I have um, Gina McKenzie. Gina's still here, Gina's there, okay. Still here. Okay. 
And after Gina, Dennis, looks like Hawkshurst, and Sherry Bar Barrett, or Barnett, excuse me. A good late evening to you, Mr. President and council members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak as a citizen in the city. And my name is Gina McKenzie, and I live in Spokane. So um, we've just been through issues that are not to be mentioned here. Um, this might be a freedom of speech issue, but we'll table that for now. Uh, I've attended, this is the third time I've spoken in front of the council in the same number of meetings, I believe. So uh, something I've noticed I'd like to bring to your attention is, um, and there was a little discussion earlier among a couple council members who were kind of not on the same page. So. Um, perhaps I'm not too out of order in thinking that um, there needs to be, uh, from what I've observed, I would share, there needs to be more clarity addressed when these ordinances, um, which shall not be named, are on uh, presented that first week that's read in and that there's a lot of numbers and referrals to other ordinances and laws. But for the public, it's to me it's a matter of... Um, disclosure and um, clarity and transparency because the average person, you know, you say, I was told, oh, just look in the internet. Well, why should everybody in the whole room have to look in the internet to find it? Like, so if the, the whatever ordinance ish could be explained, like what what's in it, like if there are uh, fines or whatever in whatever ordinance, Perhaps that could be spelled out from the get-go when it's presented. So I'm going to encourage you to, just from my observations of being here, it, to um, present it a, in a little more open fashion, whichever ordinance it is. Um, any laws that are made in the city should be fully revealed to the public before, you know, as it come, as comes forward, and before, definitely before it's uh, voted on and passed, which I don't think ha is happening. Um, so in the language in the ordinances, well, certain ones are is pretty obscure to the average run-of-the-mill person. So um, I think we need some full disclosure and, uh, and a little better communication with the public. So, and I don't understand, and I, I guess my time's almost up. I just hope that you will really focus on representing the citizens you're supposed to be representing because a lot of people don't think that's happening now, and people are waking up and they're not happy. So I just wanted to let you know that um, not allowing public input is, it could be considered a, sec a freedom of speech issue and... Your time's this, up. Gina, thank your you. Time's up. Thank okay. You. And I hope you'll represent the citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, so before we have any more speakers, so we're at 930, which is when we end it, unless we extend it. We have about 13 people signed up. I don't know that they're all, here. They all here. I don't know that they're all here. So I would move to extend. Okay. So can we extend? Motion to extend for 15 minutes. If we go much longer than 15, some people have to get their car out of the garage but, um, before it closes. But is there a motion to extend for I'll 15 second minutes? second for the 15 minute extension. Okay. All right. Any discussion? I'm wondering how many people actually haven't spoken who are up here still. Can we see a show of hands? Yeah, well, show of hands. Those who have. Yeah. All right. Dennis is right here. Come on up, Dennis. Sherry is here. Shane Lindsley, are you here? Shane's here. Kim Schmidt. Is Kim Schmidt? Kim's there. Okay, well, you don't have to. I'm just, you're, I'm just asking people to raise their hands so we can see who's there. Is Curtis Graham here? Curtis is here. Um, Bernard? Is there Bernard here? Looks like not Bernard. Valerie Coffey. Valerie's here. Catherine Cork, are you here still? Well, that's two people not. George Taylor, I don't see right. George. Alex Collier's still here. Okay, all right, thanks. Guy Presley, 
Okay. And then Cynthia Schroeder. That's five people not. How about Dave M? Oh, Dave, still on the phone? Okay. All right. So, all right. So uh, we have eight people, sounds like. Let's see if we can get down to 15 minutes. Do okay. All right. Dennis, please um, introduce yourself so we get your name, your last name right. I know <laughs> President Councilman, rest of the council, I'm Dennis Hawkshurst. I'm a citizen at large here in Spokane. And what I would like to do is uh, I was a little late to the party with regard to the water conservation issue. So I came prepared uh, to discuss that, but that's not what we were doing tonight. But what I would like to do is to uh, give my time to a very important message from Steve Bush. So I would like to continue with his thought. It shouldn't take but a couple minutes. <clears throat> the city of Spokane has previously adopted water reduction strategy uh, called the WaterWise program, which pays people to reduce water consumption and encourages residents to replace their lawns with gravel, artificial turf, or flammable materials such as bark and mulch. This type of lawn and water reduction strategy already enacted will increase the heat island effect around homes and businesses resulting in increased energy consumption and additional expense for cooling during summer months. Raising water rates or instituting a tiered water rate disproportionately impacts lower income neighborhoods. Dried out or negligent or excuse me, neglected lawns negatively impact home values while putting the entire community at an increased risk of fire. In closing, I would encourage the council to delve much more deeply into the facts about our amazing regional water supply and the natural geologic and hydro hydrologic conditions that impact seasonal low flows in the Spokane River. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dennis. And uh, I'd like to close with saying uh, to uh, Councilman Cathart, thank you for being the voice of reason. All right, thank you. Uh, Sh Sherry, come on up. And if you go faster than your three minutes, that makes it easier for everyone to get in. But thank you, it's so good to see you again. President Briggs and all members of the council, Sherry Barnett and I live in Spokane. Um, you all know that I love talking about de Tocqueville and also about, um, oh gosh, I skipped his name now, the guy at Solzhenitsyn. The one thing I didn't tell you about Solzhenitsyn is that originally Solzhenitsyn was a soldier in the Russian army. And Solzhenitsyn made the mistake, and he was highly honored. He, did, he served well. But one day he called Stalin the man with the mustache, and for that he was thrown into the gulag. And I see a certain amount of tyranny sweeping into our country. Um, I, I'm not trying to put you guys on the spot here, but Bingle being singled out to be humiliated over a mask and um, Matt Shea being called a terrorist and everything he does being twisted and turned when he is truly a patriot. And the people from the January 6th, anyone who stands up for Trump, they're being there is a tyranny in this country that is trying to persecute those people. And about the water, grass makes oxygen and uses CO2. And I used to work at the water district in Ramona, California. And it was at a time when they said, uh, we were putting gigantic fluorescent flags up for the ag users so that they would know when they could water because they might empty a tank and break a line. Anyway, within one year, roads were washed out, bridges washed out, the full lakes and rivers came back to life. I'm just saying we, we aren't at a total emergency, and I don't mean to be too harsh. Shalom. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Shane Lindsley. And after Shane is uh, Kim Schmidt. President Beggs. OK. 
Council. Thank you for those that have um, come up to the Grandview Thorpe neighborhood. I'm with the Calv and I'm, I'm a pro moratorium. Um, my grandchildren are fifth generation Spokenites. Okay? We've been here, we've seen a lot of change. I live up in the Grandview neighborhood. We own three homes up there. Um, we have, um, we've seen an irresponsible development take place. It was one thing when it was Phil Spokane and fill in the gaps. And um, my sister-in-law was the real, is the real estate broker for Douglas Properties, so I'm not against development. But one of the things that Douglas had to deal with when he, when he built our neighborhood was it's on a massive blue basalt rock up there. And what's taken place is now K Kelly Bishop is building a cul-de-sac and CDB Builders comes in and they're doing explosions and, and a, 200 yards away, my house is rocking. My foundation is cracking from, from explosions taking place 200 yards away from my house. And since that's taken place, now the wetland that's at the end of my yard, I, I live at the end of 21st. I'm the last house on 21st, at, right at the city county line before the city annexed the county line. And now they want to take what is a wetland that usually is six to eight feet deep that is now has no water in it because these guys have exploded the, the lining of, of, the, of the ground underneath the wetland that has been designated wetland by the city, and there's four different designations, and we're going to try to get it to the higher designation, which gives us a larger boundary, okay? Um, but what's happened is now we have no water because they've cracked that substructure from the explosive work. Now they want to build 98 houses behind my house and do explosions and level the entire mountain mountain and take out all the vegetation. Well, we're on a 200 plus year old um, game path that comes down the Spokane River from Canada, goes along the Little Spokane, comes up along the trail, goes through our neighborhood, and that's why Douglas built 10,000 square foot lots without fences, so that the moose and the animals could range through there out to the Palouse. And now we're gonna, we're gonna take that density when you guys, well, you guys weren't there, but they sold to Greenstone the property that was designated and donated as a, as a green space, now it's going to be designated down to 4,000 square foot lots. That's, going to, that's eliminating a nursery zone. We have mating bald eagles. We have, we have, it's a nursery for moose. It's, it's a, all the animals up there. So, so I just implore you guys, not only are there all these safety issues, and the fire chief has blocked any development because of this for years, for decades, uh, to please come up and walk it like some of the other council members and you'll see how preposterous it is. In the wintertime, the, the road, the trees fall in and you can only drive one lane coming up 16th. And the two bridges going out, they're, at least one of them's condemned. Shane, we're at the end of your time, but thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Kim Schmidt. And after Kim, I can't remember if he's here or not. Curtis is here? Yeah. And after Curtis is Bernard. Hi, Kim. Good, good evening. I have some direct quotes to read for you. So due to the unknown length of this ongoing riot, I had previously stopped using my body camera to, to preserve battery life. My camera was not recording and did not capture this unexpected incident that landed in our laps. New quote. I was operating and communicating tactics to combat large crowds and my body-worn camera was not activated. New quote. Due to being in a heavy vest and helmet, I was not wearing a body camera. New quote. During the duration of my first contact and any other contact, my department issue body camera was activated recording audio and video. It should be noted that my body camera battery died later in the shift. New quote. No body worn camera due to SWAT tactics. Tactics, sorry, I can't speak anymore today apparently. Um, it's past my bedtime. New quote. I was equipped with my own body-worn camera during the protest in the area of the red wagon, but then I suited up with my cart gear and vest and could not find a suitable place to keep my body camera with all my gear. I had it in my pocket for the rest of the night. New quote. See reports and videos by other officers. New quote. See other officers' reports for further. I was not equipped with a body camera, and it was a SWAT incident. These quotes are a very small sampling of quotes related to the use of body-worn cameras for a protest that was eventually declared a riot. The date of the incident was May 31st, 2020, just over two years ago. The BLM rallies in downtown Spokane. 
I've received what I estimate to be 150 police reports, a total of 345 pages related to the rally through a public records request. While I've yet to read each report in full, the trend of notating lack of body camera usage was evident early in the process of reviewing these reports. In section 703 of the Spokane Police Department's manual, it outlines the use of body-worn cameras. It begins with saying, body cameras are a valuable tool for promoting transparency in law enforcement by recording citizen contacts with police officers. Okay, cool, sounds good. The last section outlines, um, officers shall document in their police reports that that they operated a body camera in instances where no police report is written, officers shall indicate through the CAD, the computer automated dispatch system, that they operated a body camera. If officers are required to mention that their body cams were activated, shouldn't they also be required to mention that their body cameras were not activated? Because I saw numerous reports that had no mention of it whatsoever. I bring all this up because there seems to be a lot of wiggle room in the manual in its entirety. The manual is available online for public review. There is nothing in the manual which specifically states that certain teams such as SWAT do not have to activate their cameras. Therefore, what is preventing SWAT officers from activating their cameras? Do they require a different style of cam for ease of use and wear? Battery life also seems to be an ongoing issue. Thank you, Kim. More Thank to you. come. All right. Um. All right, Curtis. Mr. Beggs and Council, thank you for hearing me this evening. It's the first time I've been involved in our local government, so bear with me if I skip around a little bit. Earlier this evening, I heard one of the council members say, <clears throat> many items on the plate of city council need more thought, input, and planning. I don't think I could agree more. I also heard another council member mention regarding the lilac parade that we can just get businesses to pay or donate more. Well, that may not happen either. The guy from Pig Out, I, I don't know if he's considered the fact that gas has just crested $5 a gallon today. A lot of our families in this town, they're, they're struggling putting gas in their car. I had a customer tell me that he had to decide between the grocery store and the gas station. And we're talking about just bringing more money in because? Uh, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. Uh, you guys, I, th I think I might have witnessed the death of a couple of great events in our town today, and I, I hope not, but I, but I think I might have. We talked about a budget to cover overtime for police for these special events that bring money into our city, but we're going to kill these events. Um, <clears throat> I wonder who appointed so, the advisory group uh, uh, on equity. Curtis, I'm just going to just a little bit. So one of the rules is we don't talk about uh, items that were on the agenda. Oh, okay. so at Sorry. today's meeting. No, I'm, right. I'm, I'm really glad you're here, but I'm just letting you know. Okay. So, yeah. We talked about stopping drag racing. Well, I, I'm a motorhead guy. I'm into cars. I drag raced and, and had sports cars after my, my street rod when I was a kid. The police were never going to stop us from drag racing. Now, maybe you'll push us off division or them off division because I don't drag race anymore. Mm -hmm. But you're never going to stop it. But we're going to put money into this. Hey. Uh, what, about, what about the problem with people down at the Maple Street Bridge having sex in front of everybody? Because uh, an employee of mine saw that. But we don't have the, the, the resources to cover that. My truck was stolen five weeks ago. Thank God to an alert police officer who paid attention to his monitor, saw my truck. I got my truck back. But when I made the 911 call, I got told, we don't have the resources to, to, uh, to do anything about it. Call, crime check. The good news is I could have afforded a new truck, but what if that was my only truck? And what if I didn't have the ability to buy a new truck? So to me, the purpose of this council and the purpose of what we do in government should be to protect our people. Public safety should be the number one concern. I don't get that. Um, <clears throat> we talked about. Uh, the, the pride event earlier, and I have a lot of pride in our city, um, but I feel like this water water issue could turn neighbors against neighbors. I also feel that Curtis, you're, you're, you keep listing every event, everything that we talked about right, tonight. So sorry, keep, so just, um, just reminding you. But I are we going to be able to keep all of our parks and things open? Swimming pools. Are we going to be able to keep our children um, safe? Are we going to be able to keep? Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I mean, right. I thought the role of, our, gov of okay. our government is to keep people safe. And now, Curtis, you're at the end of yeah. your time for tonight. Please come back. It's great to hear your enthusiasm. Yeah. Thanks. 
Um, so we're at a little bit. We have maybe four or five people left. Is there a motion to just extend until we get to the end of the list? We'll do ten minutes each. Right. We've gone this far, so I'll make the motion. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay. Uh, oh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Councilmember Kinnear, request you stay <laughs> two minutes each, but go ahead. But you have the full three minutes if you want. But uh, okay. So Bernard is next. Is Bernard here? All right. See, there's all right. Valerie Coffee. After Valerie is Guy Presley. And this is what I actually came to speak about today. Um, our city motto, near nature, near perfect, and for Grandview, Thorpe, and Leita, nearly gone. I grew up here. I'm a third generation LC Tiger. My grandparents were Simchuk Sporting Goods. And you actually recognize my great uncle here for being 40 years in your park service today. My father built my home in 77. And in 36 years, we've seen a lot of change. Now, I wrote a whole bunch of other things down, but I'm going to skip down to the bullet points with the Cal V situation. First and foremost, Sunset Hill, with the highway being uh, limited down to the single lane, as well as the turn that Joshua had mentioned earlier, uh, is not adequate access for us in this neighborhood, especially if you turn around and actually cut off 195. For me personally, that is my basically only route into work. And if there is a fire or if that bridge ends up getting the work that it does truly need to get done, what happens to our access? Um, I'd also like to just quickly note that we have almost zero services, not limited, but almost zero. Uh, no public transportation, no bike lanes, limited sidewalks. All our kids are bused to the South Hill. I was one of those kids. It's a long day for us. And again, with the fire access, there is one route in and one route out. So for an additional 1,000 homes, I don't really know how that's going to look if there truly is an emergency of some kind up there. Um, I'd also like to make the point that these homes that are being proposed to be built are not for low to moderate income families by any means. All of these are looking like they're going to be half a million dollars or higher. So they don't really satisfy um, the need that we continue to talk about here with housing. Uh, there's major issues, and ultimately, I think everybody here is asking for the moratorium really to get a comprehensive plan. We've needed one for many, many years. Now is the time, and I loved what the other gentleman said, that now is our opportunity to do better and to plan for the future and do right by our kids and our future generations. Um, so the last thing that I just want to say here is please listen to your voters and those who love living here. I want our motto to mean as much to you as it does to me. And I'll leave you with this final thought. Our airport motto is GEG, -E planning for the future. So let's do that. Thank you, Valerie. All right, next is Guy Presley here. There's Guy. Greg, Greg I'm sorry. My, my, my terrible handwriting. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, and I'm sorry it's so late, and I will talk very quickly and then let you go to sleep. <laughs> Um, I'm also from Cal. I'm from the Grandview area. I've lived there for two years and um, owned the house that I'm living in for um, almost 20 years. Um, a lot of the discussion that I've had with certain uh, government officials has to do with the government's uh, own Growth Management Act, which says in a city you're supposed to infill. You're supposed to build it up the city as much so that we don't sprawl endlessly. Here's the problem. That Blueprint was designed for flat cities in the Midwest where you could sprawl endlessly. We have huge geographical boundaries here. We have a creek that's very deep. We have basalt hills, which are very steep. We have erodible land all along there. There's reasons why that land was never developed in the past, and they were good reasons. Now we have uh, developers who are willing to skirt some of those issues or try to make it better or try to develop. But the, the reason why there's no school over there and all those other things, the infrastructure that people are talking about, and the reason that the highway is squeezed up a narrow valley and the railroads are squeezed along a narrow hillside is because of the geography. It's limiting the growth. It's limiting. It should have limited the growth. So um, I think that you have to, if you're getting pressure from other legal advice that says, we have to follow the mandate of the, of the Growth Management Act. You have to say, 
you have to push back and say we have we cannot grow this way because of the ge the ge geographical limitations of the west side and um, i hope that you will consider this moratorium that we're all encouraging thank you thank you greg hey can i hey greg did you used to work at riverfront park years ago maybe in 1979 <laughs> We worked together at Riverfront oh, Park. Oh, scary. All right. Okay. Yes, we did. <laughs> I thought right. you looked familiar. All right. So Is <laughs> Cynthia Schroeder, if I get that right? All right. About Dave M. Oh, Dave M's on the phone. Okay. So, Dave, if you'd like to hit star three. No, go ahead, Dave. Welcome to City Council, Dave. Dave. Dave, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Welcome to City okay, Council. Well, you know, every time, thank you. Every time you uh, you say, you know, whatever, anyways, when I press star three, it wants to tell me in my ear that I've raised my hand and all that. So that takes some time before I can answer you. Okay. Um, hey, I, I want to congratulate the council on... Uh, shutting us up tonight regarding the uh, items on the agenda. I was also told that we would be allowed to speak and uh, then got an email that, oh, no, no, uh, in a backroom deal, we decided that to vote you out and shut you up. So that's disappointing. Um, I guess if you don't want to hear it, you don't want to hear it. But I, but I have a question regarding revenue and that is speaking with the water department, uh, they are budgeted for so much money, uh, they need so much revenue. And if there's a reduction in usage, which is a good thing, uh, they will have to increase rates to keep their budget online. Uh, so that means basically we're all gonna pay more for less uh, along with this. The other thing I wanted to ask about is on my personal water bill, and I'm sure everyone else in the city, according to the water department, there is a water wastewater capital uh, of $32 and something cents per month, which I'm told is for infrastructure, and it was passed by the city council. That comes to $386 per year per household. And I'm wondering if that charge will go away with this water reduction. So I, I don't know, this, the water department could not tell me when the end of that, uh, that little fee, uh, $386 per year, when that's gonna end. They said there was no end in sight. Uh, one, one other item is you probably shortly will be getting uh, something come across your your counsel there regarding this uh, proposed 10-story water tower up on the South Hill. Now, we hear a lot about conservation and, and trees and keeping everything in nature natural and leaving, leaving the old growth alone, but regarding this proposal that the Spokane School District uh, said okay to the city, to build this 10-story, 2 million gallon water tank on a school playground over the kids' heads and destroy all of the old growth trees in that area. So I think this will be coming across right. you guys, probably for a Dave, rubber stamp Dave, uh, to you're, fund it. You're, you're, at the end of yes, your, you're at the end of your time, but thanks for waiting okay. for so long. And also just to be clear, when we discuss the rules for voting tonight. It was at an open meeting, but you can come back at a future week and talk about it. It's only because it was on the discussion tonight. So please do. Thanks. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. Thanks for all of you who lasted the whole long uh, evening. We appreciate uh, your engagement. It boosts our energy to see you all. And uh, please take care of yourself. And if you can, take care of someone else. We're adjourned. Take care of yourself and someone else. Thanks.